Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 169, for real this time, Easter <laughs> AMA, and Escaping with Rich Stuff in the Goonies. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, working with you to make your gaming night better. We record here live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop. And it would be awesome if you could join us in the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch. Now, with lots going on in the Easter holiday weekend upon us, uh, I decided to take things easy tonight and decided we go with a live AMA where we'll be answering shorter questions from our fans and the fine folk in our chat room here on Twitch. Now, after that Q&A period, we will be reviewing the Goonies Escape with... One-Eyed Willie's Rich Stuff, a Coded Chronicles game. And wrapping up with our usual weekend review with some uh, thoughts on founders of TOT Hawakin, uh, maybe a bit more about the Goonies, as well as one other game that is completely skipping my, uh, my charter stone. Yes, a, a, a wrap-up, or wrap-up. No, we're not done yet. A continuation of our content about our charter stone campaign. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Now, first up, Derek Pierce has one for Sean and his topic of supers RPGs that he's been checking out, which included Silver Age Sentinels. Now, Derek writes, there was also a tri-stat version of Silver Age Sentinels that was far superior to the D20 version. Right, there was, absolutely was. And I believe we even mentioned it, at least in passing in our discussion, uh, because it, it is mentioned in the D in the in the D twenty book that there is another version, the, the, the TriStat version, but the system change from D twenty to TriStat doesn't, however, remove the problematic content or the problematic creator from the game. Fair enough. Now, next up, the op caught our party time podcast episode to say this was a great discussion. Party games rock. <laughs> Thanks, the op. Uh, I've said it before. I'll say it again. It's always awesome when a publisher actually checks out our content. Thank you for that. Now, speaking of the op, we got a couple of comments on our Telestration's 12-player party pack content. Chris Groff writes, I have grown to dislike this game, but I also have to confess that every time we play this game, I do have fun. <laughs> but there is a sweet spot between fun and it overgrowing its welcome. Playing with seven players once through seems to be the extent for me. At 12 players, I don't know that I could stomach it. <laughs> and Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, writes, I love Telestrations so much, it gets funnier with the skill of the artists being more polarized. Well, thanks for the uh, different views there, folks. I have to admit, I was a little surprised to hear Chris's comment. I honestly think that might be the first person I've ever heard that didn't enjoy Telestrations. Like I knew they had to be out there, but I definitely hadn't met one myself. I, I ended up actually quizzing Chris on this because I was like, what don't you like? And his problem was the downtime. I guess he's a very fast drawer and it was a matter of he would draw things and then just sit and wait and wait and then eventually get past a book. And he would look quick and he'd make his guess and then you see people sitting there going, oh, and thinking about it. And the game just took far too long, which I got to say, okay, I guess I can see the problem. I've never had that problem. Usually I'm the one that's like someone calls, you got to stop drawing. And I'm like, oh, I want to add one more little dot here. Yeah. Nope. So I get it. It's fair. I do wonder if maybe they house ruled it and weren't using the timer, though. Possibly. We do talk about house ruling illustrations in, in various ways. So. All right, well, since we're talking about Chris Groff, he also commented on our gaming-related thing, gaming things to do between games blog posts to say, spend time researching the next game to buy. Spend time looking at reviews of games you already own to make sure their opinion lines up with your own. Okay. Hop on BGG forums for a variety of games to make sure you are playing the rules correctly mm -hmm. and make sure someone else isn't. <laughs> and did I mention researching the next game to buy? Well, thanks for that, Chris. Um, I recently republished that article on a Throwback Thursday post when I actually had like lots of free time on a Thursday. And uh, I put it up on social media, and I'm glad that people are at least checking it out and it's getting some new attention. Now, I gotta say, everything Chris points out with, I agree with, mo for the most part. Um, I'm very amused by the, the make sure other people are following the rules correctly, which I'm assuming is follow up with pointing out their problems and what they did wrong. Uh, I, I, I have to admit, I do that. For a couple games, Quirkle is a game. If you show me a Quirkle pitcher, I'm going to look that pitcher over to make sure you haven't misplaced a tile because it's so easy to do in that game. 
And I'm sure there's some other blockus. If anyone shows a blockus picture, I always go through to make sure there's no, you're touching your own tiles in a blockus game. So I totally get with it. Now, as for looking at reviews of games you already own to make sure their opinion lines up with you, that is actually something I used to do that I've actually stopped. That is something I don't do anymore because I found myself really enjoying a game, having a great time playing with my friends, then sitting down and watching some influencer, some podcaster, some YouTube video where they just cut up the game. And despite the fact I've had fun playing the game up to that point, I find that my opinion on that game changes. I'm just like, oh, yeah, this game's got problems. And sometimes it's pointing out something I missed, but other times there's really nothing wrong with the game, but that colors my opinion. So I actually try to stop listening to it. Like if I have an opinion, if I'm still researching game, sure. But if I'm like, if someone now said, here, read these Tales from the Loop reviews after last week's review and the written review I published on the blog, I don't want to see anyone else's Tales from the Loop reviews at this point. I've made up my mind about the game. I'm happy with what we've said about it. And I don't want that tainted by anyone else's thoughts. Fair enough. All right, well, next up, Hail Blue, who tried out the Veil Dancer hero set and adventure for Aventuria, wrote to say, I played this adventure today solo, and besides the middle event, I was not able to win the second part of the adventure. Mm. It was just impossible to get rid of 16 plus obsolete cards that I had on the table. I'm very disappointed by the story and by the game mechanic. I would not buy this hero box again if I had the choice. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, Pale Blue, though it is a good uh, good indication that not every expansion, not every game is for everyone. Now, while we had some significant issues with the story in that adventure box and the content and what they warned you ahead of time or didn't before we played, the rest we liked. Like, uh, we actually really liked the new character. Deanna likes it enough that she's now playing that character in other stories. Uh, it's actually now one of her favorite characters. And personally, I thought the twist in the mechanics... The, what ruined the game for Pale Blue was fantastic. I actually thought that was a great twist and a really neat thing to have in an adventure area game. Now, what I would suggest to Pale Blue, I know they're a little frustrated when writing this and, and from playing it, I would say try again because now you know the twist and you can prepare for it. Again, I don't want to spoil it. You might have an idea of what happens, but now that you know what's coming, you're probably going to play that first half completely differently. And then just think of it as one of those Dark Souls moments, right? Where you just, oh, I, I died. Okay, now I know how the bad guy's going to move. Now I can try again. Or don't. You know what? It's your call. If you didn't enjoy it, I'm not going to force you to play it again. I will say, of all the adventurous stuff we played, this was probably our least favorite. Though we did like some aspects of it, which you can read about on our review, and I'll throw links to all that in the show notes. All right, well, let's finish off with a few comments from last week's episode on crossing the streams between board games and RPGs. Todd Zercher commented, Oh, back in the day, we played Battletech Mech Warrior, so there is that intentional level of integration between a tactical game mm -hmm. and the RPG. Yeah, with, uh, with everything we did talk about last week, and we kind of went in circles a bit, I totally did not think of the Battletech Mech Warrior thing. Like, Battletech started off as a, a tactical miniature game. And then there was a separate book called Mech Warrior that told you how to role play around that, but still kept the core battle tech system there. And that also reminds me that back in the day, and like we talked about Warhammer Fantasy Empires, but we didn't talk about the fact that Warhammer role play and Warhammer Fantasy Battle were literally fully compatible. There were conversion rules back and forth. And when new army books came out for uh, Fantasy Battle, it would have rules in there for fantasy role play as well. Uh, the Realm of Chaos books are another example of that, where it had rules for both systems. And then I was thinking about it, and, and again, it's another mech game, but I remember Mechton, the, um, we're talking about TriStat systems, Fusion System Mechton had a full set of miniature war game rules in there. And jumping even further back, now I don't know what's older, Battletech or Fasa Star Trek, but they're both 80s, 70s maybe even. Um, that had a separate box called the Star Trek Three Tactical Combat Simulator which could be used to play a game that is uh, remarkably similar to Starfleet Battles, uh, which some people will, 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 will take uh, umbrage with. Uh, but you could also use it with the role-playing game. So it was also a bridge simulator, and you could play it on its own. And I own that. It's downstairs. I actually have an unpunched copy. But I got mine because when they put out the second printing of the fast uh, Star Trek role-playing game, it included the Star Trek Three Tactical Combat Simulator all in one box. So honestly, that's a whole bunch of mashing of RPGs and board games from back in the day. That it, honestly, when I think about it now, it's kind of weird it's not happening now. 
Like I know Cubicle 7 has an Age of Sigmar RPG out. I highly doubt that ties to the miniature game at all without, except for background information. And I'll say Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 4th Edition, what I've read so far, there's nothing about miniatures in there. All right. Well, Stray Cat writes, I often try to incorporate board games or board game parts into my D&D games. I find they work as a nice break, trying to find something a little different for the night to shake things up with the Kavit to use them sparingly or else it starts to feel gimmicky. Used Jenga from the idea Dread RPG, trying to build a growing sense that something bad is going to happen. Liked it. <laughs> Tried again, twisting on this idea with Kerplunk, changing the marbles for D20s. Admittedly, they are simple games, but there was a positive response from the table. The D&D party was chasing a bad guy through town. The next session, I used Scotland Yard. Yeah, I know, but I don't own Whitechapel for the chase. <laughs> I wasn't sure how they'd take to not playing, actually playing a full night of D&D, &D, but they totally dug it. And when they caught him, we switched to D&D &D for the battle. Nice. I've taken puzzles from board games to use as room encounters, traps, locks, etc. Put away the silly cardboard and Haba's Dragon Breath is a nice dexterity game. Cool. I use meeples as crowds of NPCs. And yes, I have purchased board games solely for plastic minis in the box. The shame to use for a D&D encounter. Great episode, guys. Oh, thanks for all those comments there, Stray Cat, uh, who I found out after the fact is actually a local Windsor gamer that I've chaired a table with in the past. And I remember him mentioning the Kerplunk thing one game night is something to try. If I remember correctly, it was actually at New Year's at my house while we were playing Gizmos. And it's awesome to find out that he actually went through with it. There are lots of great ideas here. Uh, thank you very much for the comments, Stray Cat. Um, uh, one pro tip from him, if you do plan to do the Kerplunk thing, you're going to have to grab a Dremel and make the bottom hole a little bigger. Standard D20s will not fit through the standard hole. All right, well, finally, our own map guy, Dave, said, so I caught up on board games for RPGs. Yes, rambly. Was like listening to my ADHD thoughts on a podcast. Also, some good ideas. Well, thanks for the honest feedback there, Dave. Um, I'm not surprised to hear uh, that a near unscripted show and a totally unscripted Ask the Bellhop segment lacks some needed structure. Um, well, I do think I want to move to less scripting, so less work ahead of time and more just open conversation between us. I think at least having a set of talking points probably would have really helped that discussion last week. Fair enough. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. We're here to answer your game gaming at Game Night Questions. With the Easter long weekend coming up and the fact that going completely unscripted last week may have been a bit much, yeah. we thought we'd take it easy for tonight and host a live AMA. So now is your chance, lobbyists, those of you in the chat room, if you've got a question for us, gaming related or not, now is the time to ask. In order to give the folk in the lobby some time to think of questions and get them in, we're going to start off with a rather interesting question from Craig Cartmel. Craig asks, tell me about the best Welsh game designers. I'm waiting by the phone. All right, now I realize this question was sent in as a total joke uh, from Craig, who is a Welsh gamer, and I have a feeling he wasn't expecting me to actually get back to him but I did manage to find two Welsh designers worth checking out. Note, there are, may be many more, especially indie designers, but as far as I can tell, using resources like Board Game Geek and Googling, these are the only two I can find on there. So if you do know any Welsh designers that I don't mention tonight, tell them to set up a BGG page, because then other people can find them, because you know what? People like Craig are out there looking for you. So the first Welsh designer I found was Adam Porter. Now, Adam Porter has his own website and has four games to his name, which include Picoco, Compromat, Doodle Rush, and Throne. Now, I am sorry to say I have not played any of these games, but I did list them now in the order of BGG rank if anyone wants to check them out. Now, interestingly, of the four, Compromat actually has the highest rating. It's in the sevens, even though it doesn't have the best rank. So I have to assume it's based on number of votes, why it's not higher up in the ranking. 
because I still, to this day, though I've been on the site since 2002, don't quite understand how Board Game Geek actually ranks things, compares to rate things, and what the geek rating is compared to the average rating and all that. Now, the second is Dave Neal, N-E-A-L-E. -E. Now, Dave Neal is actually best, most well-known for his work on Sherlock Holmes consulting detective, The Baker Street Irregulars. Note, this is only one of the various Sherlock Holmes consulting detective games, and he is listed as the sole designer on this one. Now, he's also listed as a co-designer on a number of other games, many being mystery and puzzle games. He's done a lot of work on the Unlock games and has been involved with the new Echo series of games from Ravensburger. These are the new ones we were talking about. I might have been on a Sunday brunch, or I can't remember his last episode, where we were talking about audio escape room games. And that's the new Echo series. So Dave Neal's involved with those. Uh, he also worked on Five Minute Chase, Dubious, and The Animals of Baker Street. Obviously a bit of a um, Sherlock Holmes fan. All right. Well, there we go. There's two Welsh designers all set. Uh, all right. So do we have anything from the chat room yet? Nothing. If just... not, we do have some stuff that was mailed in. Yeah, no, nothing just yet, but we did have some from the AMA questions on our Discord. So, uh, first up, uh, Mo, recently you have read The One Ring and Warhammer Fantasy Beginner Boxes. If, okay. you, if you had a, a group ready to go and no obligations, which one would be the first one on the table? All right, first off, I haven't finished Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay yet. I, I, am, I am still reading through that one, so that, that's going to color things a little bit um though i'm far enough in um but i don't know all the rules yet because as i described this game before so these are two very different ways to present a role-playing game uh rule set so it's kind of interesting so hey uh tales from the, the one ring said <laughs> uh, one ring the one ring is very traditional there's a book full of rules there's a bunch of pre-gen characters there's an adventure book and then they threw in an awesome thick source book for the area the adventure takes in then there's a couple player handouts and stuff and some dice, right? So that's that's your pretty, to me, standard RPG box set. Whereas Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay only has a bunch of character handouts, character sheets that they tell you not to peek in, some dice you can't read, which that's a whole other issue, and a bunch of handouts and cards that kind of have the rules on summary sheets that looks like, you know, a bunch of sheets from Esoteric Order of Gamers. It's kind of odd. But no rule book. There's just an adventure book. And then those rules are presented as you're reading the adventure. And I don't know if all those rules are on the reference sheets, but I've got to say it's been awkward trying to learn the game. And as I read it, as you get further in adventure, of course, more stuff's been introduced. So I just the other day, I read the rules for critical hits and I'm like, oh, wow, these are quite different from the original game. And I, I think what I almost need to do is stop and read those sheets separate. So because of that, the question is not quite fair because I haven't finished Warhammer. So without it being finished, I'm like, well, of course, I don't want to run that yet. But let's say in a magic world, I've now completed reading both. And I hate saying it, but it depends. If the situations was how it is right now and I can game with the people I can game with, I'm going to totally say the one ring. I'm probably going to run it with Tori, Kat and Deanna. And because the one ring box set is family friendly, which the Warhammer is not, not to be surprised, not, not surprising, but it is not. I want to play with my kids. I think my kids loved The Hobbit. I don't know if either kid ever made it through Lord of the Rings, but they at least love The Hobbit. They know what, they know what, um, uh, halflings, what the, what are they called? Like hobbits, thank you. <laughs> they, they know what, wow, I'm like forgetting all the <laughs> words tonight. They know what hobbits are. They know what the Shire is, sort of. So I kind of want to sit them down and watch the at least the opening sequence of the first movie. Maybe that'll get it better, especially because it's set in that area. Yep. And then she they can visual. I think totally the One Ring. Now, if Sean was coming into town and my friend Eugene actually could come across the border, I would totally be running Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay Fourth Edition and spending most of the night hearing from Eugene why it sucks compared to the old edition. I it would totally depend who, it, and then honestly. Almost what I'd rather read run is Sentinel Comics. Like this is if Sean was in town, but not Eugene, I would totally run the Sentinel Comics role playing game starter set, which we reviewed. Did we review it? Not yet. I think no. I reviewed. We did an unboxing. I can't even remember if I reviewed that. No, I don't believe we've reviewed. That. I don't think we did. Yeah. 
I think I was going to run it. I decided not to do a read review. But like, and, and with the new edition of Marvel out, I think I would love to run that just so I can kind of compare with all the talk on Marvel because totally different style of uh, superheroes RPG going on there. From your, your mechanical crunch, let's see who has the highest stat to open-ended story gaming where powers aren't even well. No, actually, Sentinel Comics powers are very defined. And there are numbers, but it's it's in between. It's not PBTA mass make up your own stuff, but it's also not here's your list of powers and how many squares away you can hit, which is, which is a difference. So between the two, I, I, I depends who's available. I, I'm thinking the one <laughs> ring probably. Like if I had to pick one, it'd be the one ring. Um, I still want to run Shadow Run Sixth Edition try it because I've never played Shadow Run. I've got that beginner box. We've got the Tales from the Loop beginner box, which I really want to run with Torian Cat now because they played the board game and to kind of go, here's the fun way to play Tales from the Loop, <laughs> not to insult the board game too much. Um, you can read my review to see why I actually do like it. Um, I, I think that'd be like, I've got the Tales from the Loop set. That would be another one. And if Sean came down, he is elite. Have you played the RPG? Played yeah, you played, played it. You played, it. Tales, yeah. you played it with Ange. So like, yeah, you no, played with me. Sorry, wasn't that wasn't Ange. Ange. Todd, 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 shoot. Todd and his son yes. getting names. <laughs> I, I'm horrible. I can't. Yeah, remember. Todd, I remembered it was Todd. But yeah, I've got the Tales from Loose Start. This is all because of the stupid pandemic, right? I got all these RPG starter sets because I love RPG starter sets and I haven't run any of them because I don't have my regular group. And I think I was even actually going to play Sentinels before Breakout got cancelled. I think I'd actually yes, signed up it, for a Sentinels it, game yep. in 2020. In 2020. Um, yeah, you were supposed to play under it. Eric Paquette. Yes, absolutely. Which is who taught me Sentinel mm -hmm. Comics. And then Plague. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, and actually, this is a good topic. So this is, we uh, we still don't have anyone in the in the chat room. They're being quiet. But you did mention the Marvel RPG. Yeah. And I think this is worth talking about at least a little bit. Now, we don't know everything. The book hasn't actually, actually been Actually, we know released very yet. little. The book, yeah, the book hasn't been released yet. We know that they are charging... 10 bucks for a playtest version of the game. Uh, but it is a full art playtest version of the game. Uh, yeah. I think most people call this an ash can, um, which if it was coming from an indie publisher, I'd be all in for, you know, I, I mm. want to help out the little guy. Disney's not the little guy though. I'm not no. quite sure why they're charging people to test their game for them, but I, that's, you know what? They did it for Star Wars, which is also a Disney license. Yeah, and, and, and again, many people have said Pathfinder did this first. You know, this is not the first time mm -hmm. someone has done a path. That's fine. You can't really compare Paizo and Disney, though. <laughs> no. Paizo is a small company. Disney is one of the largest companies in the world. Um, it, it's not a money thing. Now, I I suspect it's related to the art. Uh, if they anything, don't have all the license yet. Well, no, they need to pay artists, right? They, they've got a well, lot of good art, and I think there is probably original art. They're going to use original. See, book. that's surprising because every Marvel RPG I have ever seen just reuses comic book art. It's possible, but and, and, and I'm not saying which I realize again, does still have licensing. Yeah, yeah. I, I suspect because this is you know they're they're moving medium, so even if they did have an art uh, uh, comic book license, they may have to pay right. to read, use it in a read, different yeah. in a different medium. It's not another comic book, um, so. I'm hoping that they're paying for art and that's why they're charging for it. Cause that's kind of the only thing that would make me not angry about it. Uh, now, as far as the game goes, it is suspected based on the stat blocks we've seen of Spider-Man to be on the crunchier side, uh, mm -hmm. not super crunchy. I mean, it's a 3d six system. Uh, or well, two, well, 2d six plus one system, I guess is. Yeah. They, they, they their own, their own unique proprietary system so that no one else can steal it basically yeah uh, their own copyrightable or is a copyright i always forget which is which whatever their own system they can claim ownership on even though you can't claim ownership on mechanics but i'm sure disney will find a way yeah so i mean it's it's roll 2d6 and then your your second your, your third d6 is your your modifier dice basically as far as we can tell uh from what we know uh, it's the 616 system, so apparently if you roll two sixes a and a one, that's the magic number to um, to roll. I, I We don't know any details in that. But looking at the stat block for Spider-Man, not only is there a long list of very specific powers, mm -hmm. but the to-hit score, like so his fight stat, 
uh, is 3d6 plus 14 plus 7. And his range attack is 3d6 plus 14 plus 3 or plus 1 or something. Probably so, multiple attack system, like your old dual wielding from AD&D 2nd edition? I, <laughs> or it's melee and range? No, because yeah. they're two separate things. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. Spider-Man so gets to thwip, thwip. You don't get just one. Uh, there's, they're getting multiple things. I know if you look at his uh, initiative stat, so he's got an initiative roll, but he also has bonus. So it's it's initiative roll plus addition. You know, he gets, he gets an advantage. So I, I believe that's probably in the case of a tie, he gets the advantage. Um, yeah. it's not, it's not specified what that advantage he gets is in the, in the stat block, but I Even assume just the list of stat blocks are like this plus 22, this plus 23, this plus yeah. 26, this plus 14. It's D and D style stat modifiers. It is. But what scares me even more is the fact that all of the powers have ranges and squares. That scares me more than anything else. I'm like, like if we're going to go to gridded combat with Marvel, that just gridded combat does not fit comic book panels that it just doesn't work like tactical combat in a superhero game shouldn't be a thing to me yeah like even as a grognard who did like to play the old dc superheroes and compare numbers and who could actually run faster mechanically i don't want grids like even marvel superheroes back in the day used an area system but at least the area system was abstract and like a big open park would be one area because you can get across it quickly like it was abstracted so i didn't mind that this looks like it's going to be grid and that scares me well, and another thing is on top of that, so you've got your climb speed of six spaces and jump speed of six spaces and swing speed of 13 spaces and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, initiative moderate with an edge. So it's, it's his uh, Spidey's initiative is plus seven with an edge. Um, and again, I suspect that just means in a case of a tie, he always goes first because of Spidey senses. I don't know. Who knows? Um, yeah, size is an issue. So you've got, so Spidey is size average. So that allows you, that gives you some of your scale. I've always, you know, one of my big things to always talk about, if you're doing a supers game, scale is important. And especially when you're getting into MCU type things where you've got Ego the Planet and yeah. Spider-Man or Daredevil, scale gets really important. Well, you also have Ant-Man. Yeah, no, <laughs> there you go. Um, now, one of the things that really kind of scares me, under powers, he has a utility power and that is Wisecracker. Uh, that is what Spider-Man does, but, but I don't how know is how that that's a power. It's, and 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 how do you how do you mechanically? That, that's, that's one of his superpowers. Didn't you realize? How, how do you mechanically enable that? I I, I struggle. I mean, to me, you find See, what I don't like is the fact that says utility makes me think it's going to be there's going to be combat powers and non-combat powers. Well, they're... which worries me even more because Spider-Man cracks a heck of a lot of wise while fighting that's kind of his thing that's well, just and it's stick. interesting because under powers it's actually spider powers and utility are the two columns of powers under the powers column yeah i don't so i i, I admit i did not <laughs> tell i'm not I'm not as much a superhero fan as sean superhero rpg fan as sean and I, I did look at the character sheet but yeah i yeah. didn't deep dive it that much it's been it's it's, it's an it's a very interesting take um I hate to say that I'm probably going to buy this because I've really been upset about the $10 cost. But at the same time, uh, I am really interested in figuring out what the heck it is they're doing here because a lot of things don't make sense. Uh, the number one thing for me is in this day and age, in 2022, when you are putting out, you're in the fourth phase of Marvel movies. You have three TV show, new brand new Marvel TV shows a year, give or take depending on the year, you have massive Marvel positive audience in front of you. Why would you make a crunchy game that appears to be catering to RPG players and not make a game that is very, very straightforward and going to be really easy to step into for your MCU fan who isn't an RPG player? And I may be wrong, but when I start th seeing things like 3D6 plus 14 plus 7, that scares me if I look at it from a non-RPG player point of view. It kind of scares me as an RPG player too, but that's because I don't like a lot of crunch. See, I, I think they're marketing to the literal D&D &D audience who are used to having stats with modifiers and skills and things being in squares and numbers. 
but I I have to agree. Something story based, quick, easy to learn. I I don't know. It seems like if if they were honestly marketing- huh, honestly Sentinel Comics that starter set is much more approachable than, from what I've seen. Yeah, and to me, I mean, if they really wanted to market to the D twenty audience, make a D twenty expansion. Why? I mean, why wouldn't you just make a D20 expansion? Why would you make a yeah, new system is... to cater to D&D players? I, I, I don't know. I mean... Because Marvel and Disney are not Hasbro and Watsy. I, I suppose, but I mean, it's not like any, anyone can make a D20 system, so... Yeah, but the problem is, if they made a D20 system, then fans would make expansions for it. Yeah, fair. If there's an open license that goes with making a D20 game. Right. Which is why I said that's why they made a proprietary system, so that they don't have... Which is going to happen. It's flipping well, absolutely. Marvel. I mean, you don't like have you're a... going to find fan content. You may not be able to buy it yep. because that'll probably be against the law, but it's going to be out there. I mean, show me one role playing game that doesn't have fan content, period. Well, yeah, <laughs> but like especially when you get into Marvel, like yeah. like Marvel comic book fans create fan content, whether they're role players or not. It's just a thing. If, if Hulk isn't in the playtest, someone will start, yes. you know, within a week of the game coming out, start, you know, you will get the Hulk stereo step lock being passed around and just so. the list the number of powers on that one character yeah. like that's one that's more powers than i think exist in masks on well, one there are character. no powers in mask i mean technically there well are. there's sort of right yeah. like you you have your your moves and you have moves that are obviously powers yeah. but i don't think you have as many moves as spider-man has utility powers yeah, well, I mean, because Sp- uh, Spider-Man has two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven spider powers and one utility power. Yeah, so that's eleven powers. That's, yeah. that's enough to write a full role-playing game. Yep. Yeah. Because apparently, you know, apparently, web grabbing, web slinging, and web trapping, and web casting are all separate skills. Okay. Why? How web slinging and web casting are different? I I feel. I mean, and casting would probably be to like web up an area. Like, like I'm gonna reinforce that crumbling building with my webcasting. I guess, and then, but then you could but also, then, I mean, that trapping could do that too. That's why I said mean, trapping <laughs> and grabbing to me are kind of the same thing. I'm assuming one's like I get you in a ball, and the others I bring you over here. Well, but. yeah, grabbing is you're grabbing something out of the air. Trapping is the standard, the tropey Spider-Man. You leave the villain hanging, yeah, yeah, hanging from a streetlight with a note. I guess, but again, do you need that? Yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I, <laughs> I, I don't want I don't want to yuck other people's yum that much, but I gotta say it's it's not what I was hoping for from a supers RPG. It's, and I gotta say, I I I wanna say Marvel Heroic did it better, but you know what? Reading that book, the game was almost unfathomable. <laughs> I didn't actually get it till I sat down and played. And once I did, it was brilliant. Yep. But like I was an experienced role player with like whatever, 30 years of gaming experience, and I'm reading this book going, This isn't gonna work. It did, which was awesome, but I had to play it to get that. And, and that that's where this. Sentinels wins because Sentinels uses some of that system and makes it simpler, right? And that's that's where I think because Sentinels is by some of the same design team, I think did a great job. And I'm like, well, you want to you want some laughs is just follow Cam Banks on this thing because Cam wrote Marvel Heroic. So Boy Monster on Twitter. Um, you get to see some of their takes now and then as someone who designed the last Marvel <laughs> RPG. And it's interesting to see, but like they completely tossed everything that went before this too. Yep. Which there is a history of Marvel games that have some tropes that have carried over just for long-term fans. Marvel TSR was my first role-playing game. It was my first experience. Didn't know what a role-playing game was. This is in the seventies. Well, by then it was eighties, early eighties. It's not like, like, I think Dungeon Dragons cartoons were on TV, but it's not like there was, you knew what a role-playing game was, or you just stumbled in on it or watched it on TV or streamed it, obviously. I'm like, that was my start. And I'll always love that system because of it. And I liked that all the previous systems tended to have some kind of homage or, or yes. things they carried over. And, and that's the stuff too, that seems to be completely missing from this character sheet is, is there going to be a morality system? Is there going to be a karma system? There is, karma. is there going to be hmm? there, karma's there. Okay. There, there is karma. So that might do it. And I also wonder about like one of the things that was fantastic about the last one was it wasn't just about fighting. So there were three different, I, I don't know, hit point stats, we'll call them just to, to keep it simple, where like I loved it because Spider-Man could beat the Hulk by ma- making him laugh so hard he turned back into Bruce Banner. 
And that's where Spider-Man would use those witty quips and stuff, which weren't powers, but there were things listed on his character sheet to use in combination with his other stuff to get the Hulk to laugh by attacking his, I don't remember what the mental stat was. There was, there was like one for stress and one for like your, your emotional well-being. And you could attack someone's emotional well-being. And if you stressed out the Hulk, he turns back to Banner. And like, you could play that out mechanically. I want to see how this game does it. That's now my benchmark of if Aunt May can beat the Hulk, because Aunt May could just talk him down. If Aunt May can beat the Hulk in your game, you've done a good job making a Marvel game. I say a great superhero game, but a great Marvel game. So the, the what we, again, we're limited still. All we really have right now is the Spider-Man stat block. Mm. Uh, there are There is health and focus, which appear to be the two uh, side-by-side um, adjustments. So you can stuff. lose your focus? So you can lose focus or health. Um, okay. Because again, Spidey is has an eighty health and a ninety focus. Those are whatever, big numbers. Whatever too. that means. <laughs> um, now, I, in case people haven't been paying attention, one thing: this is the Marvel six one six system, and not only is the six one six the dice, but Marvel is the powers or your stats. So your stats are might, agility, resilience, vigilance, ego and logic because they had to spell out marvel somehow you know what that's fine that's, that's easier to remember than phase rip <laughs> um, most people who played back in the day do remember phase rip but uh, and, and it is it is a it is a score modifier system yeah so, it's it's a, it's a you roll the dice and add your thing yeah so it's it's you know you, spidey's might is five with a modifier of plus 12 um, but like plus 12 added to 3d6 that seems like a really odd curve yeah no, absolutely. And I mean, you look at the fight damage and it's 3d6 plus 14 plus 7 for range damage. I, 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 I And I how no he idea. does more range damage than fight damage, I'm not clear, because Spider-Man hits really hard. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't tell you. The reason his amazing Spider-Man isn't his agility, it's his strength. There we go. That was a quote from the old Marvel. No, Absolutely um but that's that's our take on on what we don't know yet about marvel yeah it was, but the marvel conjecture statement yes, set, the marvel set, conjecture section. statement um, the marvel conjecture at some point segment. probably on a sunday we'll have more to say about it i don't know if we're going to do a a full section i don't know if you buy it well yeah. we should totally do a full review maybe, I, maybe I, that'll I, happen maybe i'll maybe i, I'll just I can't say anything me. i bought the star wars edge of the empire Play test that came with stickers to put on your dice to make the custom dice there you go. and and i read through that and and enjoyed reading it but what i took it as as a this is going to tell me if i want to spend 80 bucks on the full book or 40 like it, it wasn't a cheap hardcover it was like 60 or 80 bucks right and i'm like i'm going to spend 10 now and get some enjoyment out of going through this because it's star wars i'll like the background i'll look at the pretty art i never use the stickers and that will make me decide, should I invest? So it was kind of like a, an investment, a potential investment, or a, I don't know what you call it, a risk assessment. So so a, a yeah. measured risk assessment. And yes, I bought Edge of the Empire. I bought um, whatever the other two are that I totally forget. The other two hardcover books, Force and Destiny. What was the middle one? That was the, that was the one that finally added Jedi. Anyway, I paid for that, so I can't say anything about it. <laughs> And then I gave it away in an extra life auction, or I either auctioned it or gave it away, and someone was really happy to take it off my hands. So, right. All right. Um, What's it cost in Canada? Is it even on there? Twelve thirty-eight. Paperback. Twelve thirty-eight. Twelve dollars and thirty-eight cents, or thirteen ninety-nine Kindle. Yeah, I, I, I even it's thirteen ninety-nine even on Amazon.com on Kindle because it knows I'm in Canada somehow. I don't know. It doesn't show nine ninety-nine when I look. I saw Matt's tweet. Yeah. Uh, I do have to say that the system fits the designer. Yep. Like they did not get a modern indie game designer to work on this. They got a tried and true classic yep. RPG writer to work on it. Yep. No, absolutely. With lots of D and D backgrounds. So. No, I mean, I, I, I got nothing against Forbeck, and, and I think, you know, I'm sure he has done a fantastic job. Uh, he also, I'm sure had some very strict guidelines to work within. I mean, mm -hmm. this is Marvel. Marvel doesn't do things without strict guidelines. Yeah. <laughs> um that's that's how they work so uh it is what it is and uh we'll see and and we will more than likely talk about it because i really think i am probably gonna end up with it but moving on I'm just gonna let's... have to make fun of you forever now I like know. oh yeah you bought that stupid right. play i test. bought a play test bought play um test. so people just play test your game normally I, I am guessing at this point it's been play tested there was probably already the alpha test the beta test the blind play test oh, all yeah. of that stuff all happened 
Absolutely. Uh, so we do have a uh, question from the chat. Uh, came in from Tech. What is the next game you are excited that is coming out soon, or one that has been out that you're really looking to pick up? Uh, you got anything? Uh, well, I mean, I've got some stuff uh, in Kickstarter now. Uh, I did back the, uh, the the DC deck builder. Yeah, uh, not at full level, but I, I'm getting a good. So, so are there rule tweaks? I I didn't look into it. I know you're you're more of a fan of that game than I am. So it's I'm, it's, it's okay. Uh, Rival, it's it, there's a new Rivals set. So Rivals is just the the, two the player. good yeah two player good versus bad. Yeah. Um, in this case, it's Flash. Uh, and then they are bringing out a set based on the video game. Um, which uh, uh starts with an I. Um, to uh, uh, the uh the DC idea. the DC combat like fight fighting fight fight video game. Um, there's there's a see I didn't even know there was a DC fighter. Uh, I'm completely blanking. Injustice, there we go. Injustice. Um, so it's based off the Injustice games, uh, and those okay. are the two main uh draws for the thing is, is rivals and Injustice. Uh, now with that. The thing I'm actually kind of both excited and thanks, Darkman Blight. I got you a little faster than you, but that's all appreciated. Um, is the new multiverse box because the multiverse box that I bought, which I'm not horribly upset about buying because I got some cards out of it. It, it, it did come with more cards and more things to play, but it is just a hunk of cardboard with three equal sized troughs with the little paper folded over the edges so that your cards can can get hooked into the mm -hmm. paper and some foam and it's and and again my, for those who don't know the dc deck builder has extra large cards for your heroes yep. so Nowhere those cards those. don't fit <laughs> and other cards get stuck in you know against the paper edges and that so they are putting out two new multiverse boxes a heroes and a villains um that are available in this set and they are like actual uh, vacuum form plastic properly nice. set with a with a slot that's big enough for hero cards they actually are making a useful multiverse box so i'm, I'm glad now, could you get that. just that uh probably if you went into like, like, for, you like went it's in an add-on or whatever and, yeah you went in for the buck and, and got as an add-on uh, and i have to say that because they're doing well and i don't think anyone is surprised that they're doing well um, the they are unlocking a ton of stretch goals just today they unlocked a new uh, mini expansion so uh, number nine I think in their expansion set which are all small uh, tuck boxes that you basically add into one of the base games okay. um, and in this case it is the Marvel bombshells which is the 1950s inspired uh, comic series that they that has run uh, in the past with all the art from the Marvel or, DC sorry, DC not Marvel, <laughs> wrong, switching back topics there. Yes, so the DC bombshells uh, art from some of their famous DC bombshells. If they were Marvel, it really books. would be a bomb. Drop. That would be amazing. <laughs> uh, so I'm interested to see, uh, you know, what's coming there. There's there's a bunch of stuff. And again, every every morning I'm getting a new email say, sort of saying, oh, hey, we hit a bunch of new stretch goals. And there's I what... assume there was like an all in, you get all the stretch goals backer level. Yeah, I mean, I'm getting all the stretch goals uh, for the stuff. Like, I don't mean the all in yeah, also yeah. get the, yeah, yeah. the superfluous stuff, but like a yeah. get the base new thing and all stretch goals. Yeah, and I can't actually remember um, at a certain point you start. They started giving you uh, a new play mat. Uh, I may okay. be in at the playmat level. I'm not even sure if that was. <laughs> I, I wanted. I, I didn't care if I got it or not. So it was everything else I was looking yeah. at when I when I jumped in. So I may get a super villains playmat, uh, which is all right. I like the one. I like the playmat I've got right now, but it's a little um, shifted towards one specific base set. Style of play. Well, okay. uh, base set. So it's got some stuff on it that you hardly ever use in in mm. in your in in other games. Uh, but yeah, so I'm in on that. And uh, well, I have to say, I am looking forward to it. So I guess that counts for this uh, this there topic. Um, Thunder Road. So you have two days left for go in and back it after back whatever stupid pled manager, <laughs> whatever the hell people do with Kickstarter at the end, so you can get the Kickstarter even though you didn't Kickstart it. Right. I I want that, but we don't have the money. So so like that's something that I'm excited for that's coming out soon. I am really looking forward to the reviews on that one. Um, based on all my friends sharing pictures, I am regretting not backing Dark Tower. 
Um, so again, I'm excited, but it's not coming. So I'm like excited in that. What's well, cool. It's out, but I'm probably gonna have to wait till Christmas till that one comes around. Um, what'll be interesting to see with both of those is what they do for retail. Now the Thunder Road, there are definitely exclusives and, and they're basically warning people back now, or you're never going to get these exclusives, which of course there'll be ways to get them, but you're not going to want to pay the price that they'll be out at. Yeah. So those are two that I am definitely not getting that I'm excited about. Um, so, so we're sort of, I'm, uh, there's hype out there. I don't know if excited about is the right word. Frustrated. I don't personally have, or I don't know, go back our Patreon, a whole bunch of you so I can buy these games. <laughs> um, I don't know. Um, the expansion for Lost Ruins of Arnak. If I was shopping for games, that's probably one I would pick up. We are loving Lost Ruins of Arnak, enjoyed every play of Lost Ruins of Arnak. And every time I share a picture of the dang game now, on Instagram, Twitter, someone's like, you played the expansion yet? You got to get the expansion. I'm like, dude, I got the game two years late. You know, I'll get the expansion next year maybe at this rate. But yes, I definitely, the Arnak expansion is something I am excited about that is out that I would like to pick up. Um, one that's coming soon is the new story expansion for Space Base. Because despite our misgivings about the final state of the game, playing through Shy Pluto was awesome. Like the actual campaign was great. Really enjoyed playing through that campaign. Though I still have mixed thoughts about the um, uh, the asteroid mining. I'm not sure on that. That's minor spoiler, but that's been out long enough. Sorry, tech. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so that's one. Um, looking to pick up. The, those are the big ones. Uh, the new Azul looks awesome. The new Azul looks really good with hex tiles, and it looks like the board's modifiable. Like you're putting tiles on hexes and then they're on bigger hexes that go onto boards. So I'm kind of hyped about that. But like, I didn't even know that was a thing until noticing a listing on Amazon. Like I literally had no clue there was a new Azul. Um, even though we talk about the games that are released each week. So that's that's a nice big one there. Um, if you got anything else, jump in. Yeah, no, I mean, excitement wise, there isn't there isn't too much. It's it's right now. It's the DC. Uh, there's there's some super well, the stuff. new Marvel RPG. Uh, the new Marvel. Um, although I'm I'm sort of I, I I'm excited to to sort of tear it up at this point. I I don't know. Again, you're still excited to learn about it. I, I'm excited to learn about it to see what they've done, good or bad. Uh, I'll admit. Uh, the DC game, and then I've got some uh super stuff I've backed, but I that's not as much excitement as I need it all. <laughs> yeah. But that's the uh, that's the addict in me. So we'll uh, we'll see what's coming up there. Yeah, I don't know. Like I, I probably should say Frosthaven, but honestly, no. Which which will probably lead to another question we'll get to later if we don't get more from the chat. We got some stuff people mailed in um, a while ago, actually. So yeah, um, what do we got? We got uh, <laughs> he noted the time. So yeah, Thunder Rome Vendetta spe special maximum Chrome is the new one that is that is ending pre-order is closing well it's not that soon on the 22nd of april okay so that's your last chance to get that one um of all the kickstarter stuff we looked at there's some interesting looking stuff but like i don't know i i, I have uh games i haven't played of my own like I, I there's enough in the pile of shame there's enough like there's stuff i got for christmas i still haven't played yet on my birthday so overall i'm pretty good uh like i said thunder road the, the two restoration games ones are the ones i i regret not getting in on and and rpg wise nothing like there's I, I there's some big stuff that just launched that people are really excited about but i don't care i am curious about marvel again I, i've been a fan for so long uh that i really am curious to know what's going to happen with that oh, oh that's so a good caught catch um uh, tech in the chat has mentioned quad hero second edition I, uh, yeah i gotta say that's one of my daughter's favorite games and the new edition looks so good ASA Ryan did a great job. I don't know who he's working with for the manufacturing, but the, they're going to come. I don't know if they're painted or just colored plastic, but like your, your, I don't, what do you call them? Your quads, your, your heroes. I don't even know what they're, your cubes are going to be fully painted in this new edition, at least as far as I can tell. Like the, the proofs he's sharing are awesome looking. And then 3D elements for the board. ISA it looks really good. I, I, sorry, I just all of a sudden, uh, someone posted on Twitter and it's a comparison are of the all the other versions of spidey's step block from all oh, there the you other go. that's cool Marvel games so now you know you, you've, we've got the one from the new one well someone just posted all four of the other spidey you know i could have done that i actually could have made that post i could go <laughs> take pictures i wonder if they have the saga edition in there, the card-based marvel rpg uh i, I love saga marvel 
I don't know. I, I I don't know which these are, so I don't know which is which. On there is game. one version of Marvel I don't own. It was the Marvel Universe role playing game. That happened to come out when I wasn't in gaming at all. That, that might is... actually be this blue one that I'm seeing here. That's blue with yeah. gold. I'll look at it some of the time. Yeah. Um. So yeah, other games I'm excited about. I was excited to get Coyote and Crow. That showed up. So that was cool. That was one of the like anticipating it's going to show up soon type of things. Um, I don't know. I, I I guess there's nothing else that really sticks out. Um, like there's tapestry expansions I'm curious about. Um, that I wouldn't mind trying out, but they're not new hotness at all. Um, I want another Coded Chronicles game to come out. You'll find out why later in the show. Someone suggested Mission Impossible. Yeah, I think that I would be that fantastic. Discussion. Mission Impossible would be an awesome license for Coded Chronicles. Absolutely. And Although, then I want to do what else would work. A team. Yeah. A team would make yep. a fantastic coded chronicle book. You've got all the different the different, Four different books. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's there's a bunch of stuff like that. Whereas, you know, something like um something like uh Knight Rider wouldn't because they don't have the character depth. Uh oh, you don't necessarily need it. Like like Shining pulled it off with only two characters. Like okay. besides the other problems with Shining, at yeah. least as far as the story was concerned, you only had the mom and the kid, Danny. I don't I, I, so I still haven't seen Shining. I have to remember that. I got to watch the Shining. I got to look it up because I've managed to find a bunch of these other, like I finally watched Jaws and a few of these other things that I'm like, I played the game. I've never watched the movie. I, I, the Shining, I keep totally forgetting about. Right. I, I think they could do a Knight Rider. Like, I don't think it would be, no, probably it, wouldn't be I'm as sure good. I'm sure it wouldn't do <laughs> But I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, or, for some or reason, Quantum but... Leap. Do a Quantum Leap, uh, Oda Chronicles. That would be, a, that would be an interesting one. I don't know. Not sure about that. Or sliders. Remember sliders? Yeah, sliders. Uh, yeah, I was saying the Ennis. I was going to say that one. The prisoner would be awesome. Prisoner is too obscure, though. I think. Possibly. I, I think sliders might be too obscure now. Yeah, I actually want to need. Now I want to go find sliders again because I haven't seen. That way, you were a huge fan of sliders. Oh, absolutely. That was fantastic. Me and like, my dad. I liked it, but you were the yeah, big yeah, fan. Me and my dad watched that every single week together. That was. That was great. Now, now I'm just like all nostalgia. <laughs> give me the v game come on let me eat some rice oh I, I i still have a v technical manual somewhere nice um <laughs> you ever watch the new series they did i did yeah so uh, i never got around to watch that. it wasn't it wasn't bad it, it wasn't bad uh it was it wasn't fantastic but i think they did some good casting they did some interesting stuff with it uh the problem was it i they, they did so much in the original series that without the story was kind of done well just making a mini series doesn't really cut it i mean the mini series was right. just the way they started everything in the original one so mm -hmm. uh it, it was hard to get enough contact in there but it was all right yes uh john you know, uh rice davis what's that what's his first name dan is calling out gimli from sliders oh yeah yeah jonathan reese davis jonathan that's it i'm like rice davis i couldn't remember his first name yes gimli um yeah i want that um <laughs> They, they could go with the whole, uh, make it more interesting, do do a breakfast club. You, you had the breakfast club escape from detention, a Coded Chronicles <laughs> game. Like, it would totally work. Got four booklets. I, the, the solving puzzles would seem a little weird in that one, but hey, why not? Yeah. Here, we end up with our own topic we made up here. What would make for a good Coded Chronicles game? There we go. We need another kid's one, too. I don't know what what's another kid's license that like I guess a little My Little Pony would probably work, but yeah, I'm trying to think of like Scooby Doo's got the mystery built in. That's what's missing, right? It is Ghostbusters. Yeah. A Ghostbusters one would be awesome. Yeah, yeah, you could do some really cool stuff with the and, and be able to have the puzzles and don't cross the streams. Come on, like that totally is one of those string puzzles. Yeah, yeah, no, that works. Uh... And then I like, do I would like '80s Ghostbusters. Like go to the original, in my opinion. Yeah, but... yeah. Um, hmm. and well, realistically, if they were to do it, they could do do it based and use the cartoon Ghostbusters images. Yes. Um. Yeah, that was not the real Ghostbusters. Yeah. not the Ghostbusters cartoon with the flying car with wings and the. Well, that, there, there's all sorts of reasons why all that happened, and the whole license because no. there was because they almost couldn't use Ghostbusters in the first place the because of that old TV show with the with the monkey and. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um yeah, that was a whole the whole world of stuff. Um I just remember as a kid being disappointed half the time I turned it on. Yeah. It was kind of like it's the USB cable. Oh, it's the USB. Yes, exactly. You'd <laughs> be like, Ghostbuster. Oh, oh. Yeah. Um, that other one was terrible. 
John Rice Davies, the third Welshman mentioned in the episode. <laughs> there you go. See, we're all about the Welsh today. Absolutely. Or technically, because the person who wrote the question in was Welsh. It was also Welsh. Welsh. Yes, so we four Welshmen in this episode. We're all uh, about the Welsh here. All about that Welsh. No, I don't, don't, don't know what I'm don't, doing. Just don't. <laughs> I've already stopped. Um, um, all right. Why don't we move on to this one? Sure. Uh, so D&D Refuge wrote in and asked, can Hero Quest make a comeback in a world with Gloomhaven? So this is a question we have on our question list, but it's obviously not something that's going to take a whole episode to talk about. And what's interesting is when we got this question is when the uh, the 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 um, pulse has rope the crowdfunding was still going on for the new copy of Hero Quest. And while the very simple, quick answer is, of course, no, <laughs> because it hasn't. Uh, it is definitely not even coming close to competing with the popularity of Gloomhaven. I don't think it's going to either. Now, what has really surprised me on my end, no, I did back this on Pulse, so there, that disclosure, no, I didn't get any review copies or anything. I backed this on Pulse with our own money. Technically, it was a gift. So um, back this on Pulse, got it and all the expansion content and all the great stuff. But like they even threw in some big names here, right? Like you've got, people who designed the adventures like uh oh what's the actor guy joe magnello or magnanello or however you're supposed joe to pronounce magnello. his name <laughs> he wrote an adventure for it right so you've got the big names you've got the the ap people you've got you know everything going for this game and since the pulse there's been zero hype i, I it's been on sale multiple times so i went through tabletop gaming deals I'm like, oh, Hero Quest cheap. No one cares. No one's buying it. There's no one talking about it. It it seems to have made a mark when it was on Pulse. And I don't know if it's a fact that everyone who liked it bought it. Like everyone who wanted it. Everyone who had that nostalgia, I've wanted Hero Quest forever, bought it on Pulse and they got it and they're happier they're not. Or if it's because of some of the initial reviews, which are we talked about it ourselves again i can't remember did we publish a review i don't think we did because we only played once but we talked about it on the show multiple times and there are issues with with the new edition and many of them are just carryovers from the original edition um I, that could be it that like, people were waiting to hear and then they heard and they're like flimsy minis and incomplete rules and and uh contradictory bad line of sight diagrams all the problems the original brought over i it's just weird like like i i I expected more of a buzz. Now, I admit, I never expected it to be Gloomhaven. Honestly, I still don't understand how Gloomhaven's as popular as it is. It is a super heavy Euro game. Why is it so dang popular? I'm all for it, but it confuses me that it's that popular. And for the mass market and people overall, you figure Hero Quest to be more popular. But I don't think I, I don't think it's going to catch up to Gloomhaven. Um, what really frustrated me, and I didn't even know this. They put out expansions, but didn't market the expansions, didn't tell anyone, and they're already sold out. So even for the collector who's like, I will collect all the Hero Quest things, now I'm back to where I was in the 90s, where I have this classic game and they put out expansions only in the EU and I can't get them. So I'm like, yet again, the new Hero Quest manages to follow in the footsteps of the original, because here I am not being able to get everything. So here's an example. Mountain Papa says, after hearing your review, I lost interest. And and I think that's part of it. And like Deanna mentioned, she said, I think the people who wanted it, the people who had the high nostalgia, got it. Or got it as soon as it came out, like at GameStop and everywhere else. GameStop happened to have a dirt cheap when it came out. And then she thinks, uh, removing nostalgia from the equation, there's just not much there to excite people. Which, honestly, that is a big price point for a game to play with their kids. Absolutely. Right? If you, like because that's basically what it is it's a kid's game and they didn't fix things like the first scenario is still like the hardest in the entire book trust me that's a turn off it was a turn off again in the original yeah no it's they made some really strange choices and i think if this had been a restoration release yeah this would have been a world of different, oh yeah we would be having an I entirely agree. different conversation here Heck, maybe and it would we, be beating we gloomhaven. might be comparing this to gloomhaven yep but because it's hasbro who photocopied a bunch of rule books and threw them out there. Basically. You know, they, they, they duplicated the art. Like they didn't even, it's no, they it's redid not, all the art, but they, they, they copied it. it. Yeah. They copied the art. It's not, it it's is not all a new. new art. It's new art. That's just redoing the same thing. Yeah. Um, if this had been a restoration game, we would 
again, this entire discussion would be night and day different. I agree. But it's not. It's a reprint. And yes, they made a bunch of changes so that they could reprint it to get away, mm -hmm. get away well, from all of the licensing and issues, issues and, and, stuff. and art issues. But realistically, it's just a reprint. And I think the best thing we can say about it is they improved the quality of the uh, set piece minis. <laughs> oh, heck. The, the actual... And I was like, Deanna's saying not all the minis are better. I don't know. I think I, overall, the miniatures are way better. I think especially, especially... Oh, in the, the scenery. The yeah. scenery. The scenery is a huge step up. But it's not hard to make it a huge step up from the cardboard and plastic that was yeah. in the original game. So, I mean, you know... It, the, they made they made the easy the easy steps the easy gains mm -hmm. on the game and 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 like i love that there's else? new content that part is awesome like there are more quest books for this than ever exist but is anyone going to get that far are they going to play through the original and then try the new stuff and actually get to see the magnum Hill stuff like is that even going to happen for most gamers I like and from what i've seen for errata that might even be unplayable i haven't tried it myself to say i mean i could see if if you know if i was down in windsor I could see we did a Tuesday night Hero Quest AP stream, right? Every Tuesday night we did a you know two hours. Oh, every three hours. Okay. I'm like, if you're uh, only here one Tuesday, we're getting through maybe two, three no, no, scenarios. Like, like every Tuesday night we did uh, two or three hours yeah. of Hero Quest AP on Twitch. That would be good because then you'd get all the people who have the nostalgia but don't want to actually have to deal with it themselves. <laughs> and there's probably yeah. a lot of that out there. But as a as a general game. It's too much money for no improvement. Go yeah. out and find a copy in some goodwill of the original game. You're not missing and, much. Well, to be honest, yeah, you, good luck if you find well, one yeah. at Goodwill. Um, what I also noticed didn't happen is the the price on, say, eBay or the aftermarket for the original did not drop. Or I thought it would. And you still, this new one's still one-fifth the price you're going to pay for a complete version of the original. So I guess if you're going to get into Hero Quest, it's cheaper than buying a, a mint copy for six hundred dollars. But but again, like hundred and what? I don't even remember how much it was. One eighty, something like that. It, it, it's not too crazy. I honestly don't remember how for much. For the amount of stuff you got, you can get it for about one ten. In right. in like right now, the a brand new go buy a box, but it doesn't come with like we got the expansions. Yeah, yeah and you got all the all the. I, I, I did the whatever mythic tier or whatever it was yeah. called. No, absolutely. I mean, I think. You, it was a lot of money uh, for someone who wanted that whole collection. I think that was great. Uh, mm -hmm. It stinks that they have put out the expansion stuff externally, but it was, again, you know, it's it was a lot of money to get it to Canada because we live in Canada, but realistically, so is everything else to get to Canada too. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so we, we spent about 300 See, I thought it was less than that, but maybe with the shipping, it was around that much. That's a lot of flipping money. But I love Hero Quest, though, honestly, at this point, we haven't played more than the one sitting. So that's a, that's a good sign. I definitely played Gloomhaven more than I played Hero Quest personally, and I loved Hero Quest. Yeah. Kids enjoyed it. It's just part of it, too, is that the game's a chore to set up. So, and actually, I shouldn't say that when I'm comparing to Gloomhaven. Never mind, <laughs> just strike that from yeah, the record. Because no. together, comparing those two, Boomhaven is actually worse to set up, but, but it's one of the reasons we don't play either around here. Yep. No, anymore. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's another one of those games where, you know, you need a table for it. You need the HeroQuest table that you can go to every night to play. Yeah, and leave it set up. And leave it set it, up. It's just the sorting the cards and stuff. I don't know. I, and no, what I haven't seen is anyone streaming it. There's a lot more people streaming Gloomhaven than I've ever seen streaming a single game of Hero Quest. I'm and, sure it happens. And it's bizarre because, honestly, I think there, I think there is absolutely a way to uh um a way to do that but who knows um all right. all right i think we got time for one more all right one last question so speaking of gloomhaven all right we've got a question from one of our awesome patreon patrons math guy dave asks what are your plans for actual legacy games after charter stone are you done with gloomhaven Okay, so we were talking about that the other day, if we want to get back into doing Gloomhaven and potentially live streaming Gloomhaven. And we were talking about why we haven't, and there's there's multiple reasons. So one of them is right now, Tori and Kat are our only gaming group. They're, they're in our bubble. It's the one other couple we've been seeing during the pandemic. Um, they both take ridiculous uh, precautions, especially because Kat is a pharmacist and works in a high-risk setting. 
they do a rapid test before coming to our house every week, right? Like, so what we haven't done is open up to the other people we used to game with, what I used to call my Monday night group. And we're not going to public play events. So this is my only chance to play games. And if I had the option to play Gloomhaven and Gloomhaven alone every week for two to five hours or play two to six different games, most often I'm going to want to play two to six different games for multiple reasons. One, I like playing new games and I enjoy playing different games, but also we do this for a living and we have to get through the pile of obligation. You wouldn't be getting to hear about Founders of Tale T. or some of the other games that we've been reviewing if we couldn't play them. So that that's a big part of it. Now, what we did talk about is maybe do every other week, right? Like we'll do Gloomhaven every other week. We could do Gloomhaven, which gets us back on Gloomhaven. And then we can still play the other games on the other week. And for a while there, it was looking like we might start getting some of the old group, especially Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, back over more regularly. But now the numbers are turning to crap again. So that I don't think that's a, a reasonable thing to do at this point. Now, the other thing is we 1,000% thought by this time there would be a studio in our basement and multiple things from chip shortages to ridiculous price to video cards to uh, the unexpected changes in what we plan to do with the house renovations and then price of lumber skyrocketing and the fact there's been a global pandemic for three years has put all of that off and we just thought yeah we'll get back to gloomhaven when we can make it look good and well now if we did it Wait, I actually probably be worse because some of the equipment we used to use has broken and I getting things transferred. I've done some permanent things in this room that would be difficult to move down there. Um, we have no good place to put the mic because I don't even have that style of boom arm that we used to use to put it above us. And just we're kind of not ready to live stream Gloomhaven again. Which leads us to the option of, well, Tori and Kat can come over and now and then we can play Gloomhaven. And we have talked about it. The thing is, Gloomhaven did really well. Sorry, Gloomhaven did really well for us as content creators. It's some of our most popular content, and honestly, for the last three years, we've been missing out on that. That that it'd be nice to get that audience back. We had our guy in the chair. He used to join us for Gloomhaven. Temujin. We had some regulars. That's it. Tamujin. Thank you. We were trying to remember that the other day. So so yeah. Um, now we are going to finish Charter Stone first. No matter what, I'm not going to try to play two different legacy games at once. Um, Charterstone, we have four games left and I'm going to admit, I'm going to have a very strong urge to go buy the refresh kit and play again. I'm thinking I may offset that because you can play it on steam and I might be willing to just start a Charterstone campaign, maybe even with some patrons on steam, but then everyone's going to have to buy a copy of the game and everything else. So I think it's in the current Asmodee digital sale. So I know it wouldn't be Asmodee because that's Stonemaier. Yeah, that's Stonemaier. But you can often find it on sale. So I don't know. That's, that's a thought. Um, because I will say, and I'm sure this is, uh, they knew this publishing this game. There's a reason they give you a two-sided map because you're going to get to certain things that happen and be like, oh, if I had known that was going to happen, I totally would have played differently. And people are going to want to play a second time so they can play differently. Like I totally get it. And we're not even done. Now, maybe it'll end just as famously as uh, Pandemic Legacy did for us and I'll have no interest in ever playing it again. But I don't think we're going to do it with Tori and Kat. Like, I don't think we're going to... Now, let's start Charterstone over with the same people. Though it is going to be tempting because it'll be the same people and we already know how to play. And I don't think I'd want to throw in someone new who didn't know what the surprises are. Like, I think we need to play with the same group. Um, I am really tempted, going back to games I'm kind of hyped for, really tempted to pick up Clank Legacy Acquisitions Incorporated. Because it's deck building, and I love Clank, and I have heard so many good things despite being so-so on the Penny Arcade Acquisitions Inc. license. Maybe I'll love it. I don't know. I, but it's just uh, Penny Arcade is Penny Arcade. I like some of their stuff. I don't like others. Uh, a silly take on D&D-ish settings seem, doesn't, I don't know. Plank to me doesn't seem like a, a silly game where you make Penny Arcade style jokes. But I've heard so many good things. It's probably worth it. So I've been really tempted by that. Um, we may go back to Gloomhaven. Um, what we should do is play Jaws of the Lion, maybe restart with four players. Maybe that's what we do just to kind of get back into the groove. Um, I don't know. I, the gloomy heaven might happen. That, that's about all I can say. We, we've been talking about it, but if it does happen, we need to find a way to fill that play other games gap. Whether that's suddenly COVID gets, I don't know, whatever, shot number five eradicates it and we can finally go to game stores again or 
I don't know. I don't know what it's going to take to get there. I honestly have not talked to two of the gamers who used to come over regularly on like, I don't, when's the last time we talked to Tom? Like, I honestly don't know. Uh, so like, I don't even know if they'd be interested in gathering that together again. It's so, I don't know. Um, Deanna may have opinions on this one. I'm watching to see if she says anything. <laughs> um, if we do start Gloomhaven again, it's going to be a mess because we're going to be like, I don't know, let's pick this spot on the map that doesn't have a check mark on it and do that adventure because I don't know what's happening. Boy, I am so cool. Maybe I'll go back and watch our own actual plays and then I'll, <laughs> I'll know what the heck's going on. There you go. um, and then when we do it, like, do we change the stream? Because like when D and I were doing, like we didn't own these bright lights behind me even then. Like think of that. We didn't even own the improved lighting. We didn't own these. Like, and are we going to set up the, the, I don't even know where it is now, the, the handy cam to, to record all of us. And then is Sean going to in post, put those in different spots? Like, I don't even know what we do. And yeah, as Deanna says, I hate moving stuff downstairs to stream. Yep. And like, honestly, I think we'd have to buy tech instead. Like, like get another set of lights. We want to buy a set of lights to bring to these mums actually, because we're now playing games there fairly regularly. Which does fill some of that gap, but the games we play with these mom are not the games we play with Tori and Cat, and right. not what we play with our regular group. So I don't know. Sean needs to move down, and then he can set up the Gloomhaven studio, and then we'll do it. There we go. <laughs> that's, that's about the best. Um, but yeah, if I was going to pick another legacy game, I think it would be Clank Acquisitions Incorporated. Also really curious about um, Aeon's End Legacy. So if I was going to do that one, and I have been hearing really good stuff about my city. So all of those are on the table, except for the fact I don't own any of them. So, and while D wants to go back to, I think we need to buy another copy of Seafall. Right. I think we need to start over in Seafall, possibly with Torian Cat. <laughs> all right. Well, I think that is going to be it for tonight's AMA. Thank you for all your questions. We didn't have too much from the chat today, but we had some other stuff stocked up and we had some stuff from our Discord. So thank you very much for those questions. Remember, we're here to answer your gaming and game night questions and make your game nights better. If you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or fire off an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Welcome to our spoiler-free review of the latest Coded Chronicles game, which is based on the Goonies 80s classic. Before we start, a quick shout out and a thanks to the op for sending us a review copy of this escape room in a box style game. The Goonies Escape with One-Eyed Willie's Rich Stuff, a Coded Chronicles game. Yes, that's the full name, and perhaps the game with the longest name in my collection right now, was designed by Jay Cormier and Sen Fun Lim, the same team that brought us the last Coded Chronicles game, as well as other great games like Junk Art and our favorite party game, but wait, there's more. This latest Escape Room in a Box experience from Jay and Sen was published by The Op in late 2021. It can be played with as few as one player and as many players as you want to squeeze around a table. While the game can be played in one long sitting, it's also designed to be split over two or three sessions with a built-in save system between the game's three different acts. Now, this cooperative puzzle game has a very reasonable MSRP of $29.99 US. Now, this is a step up from the previous Coded Chronicle games, mm -hmm. which only had one break in the middle of two acts. So pretty much as expected, The Goonies Escape with One-Eyed Willie's Rich Stuff follows the plot of the original 1985 Spielberg and Columbus classic, The Goonies. Note, you don't have to know the original movie or well or at all, really, to be able to play this game. But there are some Easter eggs for those who do know the film. In this Escape Room in a Box style game, you take on the role of the Goonies who are searching for One-Eyed Willie's rich stuff. You do this by using various character skills to interact with the growing map and items you find while exploring. Be careful though, the Fratellis are hot on your trail, and if you make too many mistakes or take too long, you could get caught. For a spoiler-free look at the stuff you get in the box, I invite you to check out our Goonies unboxing video on YouTube. Now, while recording that video, I made sure not to open up any of the sealed envelopes. So you don't really get a good look at the components, but you did get a good idea of how much stuff is in the box, and it's quite a lot. Now, I will say here that the component quality is excellent, and there is more physicality to this Coded Chronicles game than the past two, and there's some very neat components that add to that. 
Now, the card quality is excellent, and I really appreciate the fact this version included a dry erase map that's not only required for puzzle solving, but also acts as a place to make notes while you're playing. It's cool to have that included. Uh, there are a total of eight different character books in this Coded Chronicles game, each of variable thickness, which can be important. Now, due to this number, I would think you probably want to limit your player count to eight at the max. And with any less than that, you're going to have to have more than one person sharing a book, but I don't think that's a problem. Now, no, for reasons I don't really want to get into, but you may be able to be able to guess if you've seen the movie, you might be better off with a cap of six players. So the books all contain a variety of content with regards to its quantity. Mm -hmm. It's not a spoiler to say that each person having their own book will lead to a significant imbalance in how much reading is done between people. That is definitely true. Um, whoever has the Mikey book, give it to whoever is most comfortable reading. And I suggest you split up the data and mouth books for reasons, again, I don't want to mention, but pair them up with someone else. You'll, you'll quickly feel just holding a book. You can yes. see this is small. This is big. I mean, well, it's not just that. Uh, there are other reasons. Yeah, no, that's fair. Now, one final note I think is important to stress. Through our entire play of the Goonies, we did not spot any issues with this game in regards to typos, spelling errors, grammatical mistakes, puzzles that didn't work, or missing entries in any of the books. Things that sadly have been a problem with previous Coded Chronicles games. Now, while I know you can't give away too much, can you at least give us an overview of how you go about actually trying to find One-Eyed Willie's rich stuff? So the Goonies box includes a very short adventure guide. You're gonna read this first. This introduces the Chrono Chronicle system, which I'll explain in a bit. Now this is short enough, there's no problem reading it at the table when you first sit down to play. This is one of those games you can cut the shrink on, sit down and start playing. Now this book also tells you what should be out on the table when you start playing. Once everyone has an idea of how to play, you're gonna divvy up those player books and begin by reading the first entry, which happens to be in Mikey's book, which sets up the entire scenario and gets you to your first puzzle, basically recapping the beginning of the movie. And that's it. Everything else we could possibly say is a spoiler. So hope you enjoy the game. Later. All right, not really. <laughs> So from here on in, I mean, we're not spoiling it. This is all in that adventure book. Interacting with the game involves combining the characters' unique skills with numbers on things in play. I realize it sounds a little weird. If you saw it, it makes perfect sense. Now, each character except Data, who has gadgets, has at least one skill. Uh, just as an example, grabbing four random characters, Mouth can decipher things, Brand can pick things up, Andy is using stuff, and Steph can explain things in a way in the annoying way that she does. Now, the way this works mechanically is that every one of these skills has a unique number, and it becomes the first number in a four-digit code, with the other three numbers coming from the stuff in play, the maps, the items, the other cards. Um, once you have the full number, you're going to look it up in the appropriate book. The player owning the book reads the entry and the game will progress with new cards being added, things changing, telling you to put things in play, move things and so on. Exactly the same method used in Scooby-Doo and The Shining, though, as noted, much more cleanly than some previous mm -hmm. attempts. Now, the use skill uh, is a little bit different because it requires two things to be combined to be used. So, for example, you might want to use a lighter with those red candles you found. Items that can be combined are represented by one or two digit numbers with the end result, again, leading to a four digit number. So you have the use skill, the one item, the other item. And again, you're going to look it up in the book and read the results. Note, you will find other sources of four digit numbers that you can look up. And some of the characters have other interesting ways to interact with things. But it's important to remember that you need four digits through some method or other to get your entry. Now, while exploring, you also have to worry about those fratellis. Each map card you put into play has one to three circles on it, and you're going to slowly build out the cave system. And there's one fratelli token. Well, the fratelli's token starts on the first circle, and it will advance on the map according to what you've read in the book. Like sometimes it just it advances as part of the story. But also, if you ever try something and that number isn't in the book, that represents wasting time. So you tried to use two items that don't combine together, or you tried to explain something that had no explanation. That sounds kind of strange, but you know what I mean? Something that didn't need explanation that was already obvious. 
the Fratellis will move up. Also, if you make a mistake in a puzzle, this can also happen. Now, if the Fratellis ever move onto the room where any of your characters happen to be, you're going to note this, and then you're going to take a penalty on your final score. It doesn't end the game. You don't ruin the game. You can't lose, but it is going to be a, a knock against your final scoring at the end. Then the Fratellis are going to reset to the furthest circle in the previous room. And yes, it is possible if you make enough mistakes, they could catch you a couple times in a row. But again, that doesn't end the game. There's no you know, character death. There's no dead end here. It's just a matter of not getting as as cool a score at the end of the game. This timer mechanic is great, as it doesn't mm -hmm. pressure you to act fast, but to act smart. There's no timer making you rush your decisions for each problem, so it's on you if you make the bad ones. Oh, and that's actually a really good point. Now, as for the puzzles themselves, they run the gamut from logic and math puzzles to some interesting physical puzzles requiring you to manipulate objects you're going to find during the game. Now, if you ever do get stuck on a puzzle, there is a hint table in the adventure guide. Now, this is important. Using the first hint on the table for any of the puzzles is not a bad thing. You don't get penalized for it. These first hints are there to make sure you understand what the game is trying to present to you, what it's asking you to do, and make sure you have the right tools on hand to, excuse me, make sure you have the right tools on hand to solve the puzzle. I strongly encourage you to use these as soon as you get stuck. Like if you're at all stuck, just look up that first entry. After that, you're going to have the choice to get further clues, but those will impact your final score. So these first clues are really just to make sure you didn't get completely confused or misled by something mm -hmm. or accidentally get something out of order. The game doesn't want to penalize you for simple misorganization or mistakes. Now, the adventure... In Goonies, Escape with one eye Willie's Rich Stuff is broken into three acts, which I mentioned earlier. They break at logical points in the story. There's an envelope, a big, nice, big one, included in the box that you can use at any of these break points to basically save your game. And this is what we did. We split the entire game over three different sessions to be able to, I don't know, draw it out and savor the game and enjoy it so it's just not a one-and-done experience and it's, it's done and over. Now, when you do finish the adventure and read about the Inferno sailing off into the distance, you can check the back of the adventure book to see your final score. We ended up with, hey, you guys are awesome. And if you play the game yourself, I would love to know how you scored compared to us. The one thing I want to know is how does the movie tie into the game? Are you just playing through the Goonies movie or is there more to it? And also, does knowing the movie spoil or ruin anything? A good question. So, so first off, you don't need to know the movie at all to play this game at all. You could totally start from the beginning and get the entire experience, the entire story right from this game. That said, knowing the movie will give you a bit of help with a couple of the puzzles, but definitely not all of them. Um, we did discover a couple of, I, I think earlier I mentioned them as Easter eggs. So rewards for doing things that happened in the movie that weren't required or called out by the game. What? I'll leave that for you to discover. All right. Well, it's always great when a licensed property cares for those who love it, but doesn't demand you yes. knowing, going knowing it. it. It's some nice bonuses, we'll just say. Now, as for following the plot of the movie, the game does that. That is, you are playing through the Goonies. You are playing through the Goonies almost word for word, pretty much exactly, with the adventure starting once the kids are in the caverns under the Layhouse Lounge. Yes, there's a bunch to read that gets you to that point, but there isn't really a game before then. It all starts once you're in the cabins. Now, this game recreates classic scenes and will have players reading lines of dialogue verbatim from the movie. No, this isn't like a script. It's not like you're going to read Mikey's part and I'm going to read Rose's part. Whoever book it is will be reading for multiple characters. So you're not doing a whole script thing, which I think would have been neat, but way beyond the scope of this, this particular project. All right, so that's pretty straightforward then, but doesn't that get boring if you're just playing out the movie and you know it already? Well, no, because the game actually does two things to prevent that exact problem. So first off, the puzzles you expect to see from the movie aren't just transported into the game. You're not going to do the same things. I'm going to give you a very small spoiler here in the fact that you are not going to put the map on a keyboard and play the notes at the top of the map. That's not something that's in this game. Yes, that scene is there, but what you're doing in that scene isn't just recreating what they did on screen. Now, second, the game interjected additional scenes. 
And it did a really good job of this because it basically reads between the lines of the movie and presents new scenes, areas, challenges, map areas to overcome. And I found all of these really fit well with the existing canon. Like there was nothing in the movie where this room couldn't happen. I almost spoiled something. There, there was no reason that couldn't have been part of the movie that they cut or just you didn't get to see because it happened off screen. And nothing felt out of place. It all felt appropriate to the Goonies. All right. Well, something for everyone then. That's fantastic. Now, finally, it is worth noting because this is an escape room in a box style game. You do not destroy or permanently mark anything or even fold anything while playing Goonies Escape from what I Willie's read stuff. Unlike some other escape room style games, you can reset this and play again, which honestly, I don't think would be that enjoyable because you'd already know the story and solved all the puzzles. But more likely, you could pass it on to another Goonies fan. And this has been an ongoing feature of the Coded Chronicles mm. games. And good to see that that seems to be their goal with the Coded Chronicles system. Well, now that we've got a really good idea of how you play through this escape room in a box, what did you think of the latest Coded Chronicles game? So this one we did play with the entire family. So it was me, Deanna, both of our kids, as well as the kid's grandmother, Dee's mom. Um, before I get into our thoughts, though, I do want to point that out that we do have a bit of a history with the series of games. So this is actually the third Codical Chroni Coded Chronicles. I keep wanting to say Codical. I don't even know where that word's coming from. This is the third Coded Chronicles game we have played. Um, all of them were sent to us by the op and, and as review copies. So we are reviewing all of them. So I want to be clear on that. And I do encourage people to check out our reviews of the previous ones, especially in that description of play, the way the skills interact. If you think that sounds cool, it might be worth checking out. Now, with those previous games, though, we've had some pretty mixed experiences. Now, I still swear Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion was one of the most fun experiences our family had at a board game table ever. It, it's, it's like it's just fantastic story. Felt like Scooby-Doo had the Scooby-Doo jokes. And I'll never forget that once my kids figured out that Scooby could actually try to eat or Shaggy. Shaggy could actually try to eat everything, not just the stuff that was logical to eat, though they're still laughing about the fact that, that, that Shaggy tried to eat the maid. I, th we just had so much fun. Now, that said, while it was a lot of fun, it was not a perfect experience. Due to some editing issues, there were some problems with the game. There was, there was a clue we missed that I think most people probably won't miss, but because of that, there was something to do with the reset. It just wasn't perfect. And I don't need to get into detail here. Again, read our Scooby-Doo Escape from the Haunted Mansion review to get the full details on that. The fact is, there is a lot of text in these games. Yeah. Now, The Shining, I'm sorry to say, was honestly a bit of a disaster. Um, there were significant flaws in that game, including a missing entry in one of the books. There was an entry that was duplicated instead of having an entry. And this had us completely stuck. To the point that after getting ridiculously frustrated, I sat down and read through almost every entry in every book, completely ruining the experience for me to try to find the proper place to go. And then there were problems with the way some of the puzzles lined up. It just unfortunately had a lot of issues. Again, you can find the details about this in our review. No, well, there are customers reporting that a separate pack that comes okay. with newer purchases, as well as an updated PDF online, it has, unfortunately, as of this recording, still okay. not solved all of the issues. And that's specifically to The Shining, or is that both? That's The Shining. I don't. Shining, I, I yeah. didn't check on. I didn't check on Scooby Doo. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and I. I know actually, Jay uh, was involved in a thread saying, "Oh, there's an." In <laughs> they added a pack. Um, so <laughs> this this isn't all on our designers. We 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 really do appreciate all the excellent effort that Jay and Sen are putting into these games, but there's mm -hmm. a lot of people involved in the production of these games. Yeah, I, I'm not trying to point fingers at whose problem yeah. it was, but sadly there were problems. Yeah. Now, here's the good part. Here, here's the, the sunny side. The best thing about this new Coded Chronicles game is we couldn't find any of these problems, like none, zip, nada. Now there was one puzzle that was a little fiddly. Um, it, it, I think could have used some tweaking or better description, but everything was there. There weren't any errors. Everything worked. If there were any typos or grammatic errors, I completely missed them. 
so far, this is definitely the most polished Coded Chronicles game by far. And what I love about that is that means that I now can have hope for the future of the system. I admit, after The Shining, I was like, oh, I hope they didn't mess up the Goonies because I like the Goonies. And I'm glad that, that this seemed to have worked. And I really do hope this does lead to more well-edited and play-tested Coded Chronicles games. Yeah, I think there were a number of missteps made in the system. And I don't think any one party is to blame, as we were saying, yeah. for these earlier issues. But it is great to see that they're hitting their stride mm -hmm. now. And we hope that that means even more Coded Chronicles goodness to follow. Yeah, there was a thread on Twitter today talking about having a Mission Impossible version. I would love to see that. Jay and Sen and the op, come on, get to the table. Now, speaking of Coded Chronicles, right? We keep calling it a Coded Chronicles game. That's because all of these games share the same basic system, and it's a brilliant system. The system of combining single-digit character skills with numbers in play in order to get you a passage entry in a book to look up is just brilliant. What I really liked about this one is you have way more characters and skills than ever before. Because Scooby, you only had the Scooby game. The Shining, you only had two characters with two skills each. There are way more options here, way more, way more different things you can read. And similar to Scooby, this one seems to be done so that it doesn't penalize you for playing around. Like there is no reason for Steph to, to explain everything or for you to try to use every possible combination of things, or for you to examine with Mikey every number you see in the game. I really appreciate that, So because it lets you play around. It makes the game feel more open and free. And this is a comedy movie, after all. Yes. So have fun with it. And I will admit, many of the entries, especially the ones that don't progress the plot, are generally added for comedic reasons. Now, another place this new Coded Chronicle game sticks out is the component quality and quantity. Um, the puzzles in this set were more physical and even included some cool 3D elements. Um, your map's a little less flat. There is one very odd choice made, though, that, that I found just strikingly weird, is the fact that characters aren't represented by standees, but are just cardboard flat tiles. And I don't know why they decided to get rid of the stands this time. Like, I mean, it, to me, it's really weird. Yeah, I, I would guess budget, but it's hard to say. It's possible even that they discovered that the tiles might work easier lining up the numbers to make the four I, digit. It is true, but like, you know what? Like your first couple rooms, you're going to get a kick out of putting your character next to the table to read the number. But after that, you're just, what's the number? 386. <laughs> and who's got book four? Like, I, I don't know, I guess. Uh, what I will say is it's better for streaming. If anyone's going to live stream this, it is definitely better for streaming because the standees didn't show up. Now, as for the puzzles, uh, they were all rather clever, um, some of which we got like instantly. You just look at it and go, yeah, I can tell what this is going to have me do. And others took us quite some time. Um, one took a significant amount of time. Now, there was one puzzle that we solved in a way that wasn't the proper way. It's not what was expected by the actual game. And then there was another puzzle where you had to physically manipulate components in a certain way. And we were having a hard time manipulating them as they expected you to. Now, in the first case, with the, the puzzle we solved, but not the way they wanted us to, didn't matter, right? We got the re result. That's all that mattered. We didn't go about it the way they wanted to. I actually looked up the clue when we got it to go, okay, how did they expect you to figure this out instead of how we did? But both worked. That's fine. Now, as for the second, we actually up, ended up ignoring a wrong answer penalty because we were trying to do the right thing and we got the puzzle and we were doing it properly, but we were getting the end result because of some fiddliness. So we didn't count that as a mark against us. Well, there are few puzzle games in the world that can accommodate any variety of approaches, you know, or every mm -hmm. variety of approaches to it. Now, as noted above, again, I'm gonna reiterate this because this is my biggest pro tip. If you're gonna buy this game, use those hints. There's no reason not to use the first hint for any puzzle you get even a little bit stuck on. If you don't look at it and immediately at least know what you should be working on or what you should be looking at or where you should be drawing things, be like, I don't know what to do. Grab that book. Look it up. Over the entire game, there was only one puzzle where we actually ended up using the second hint. And that is actually why we didn't get a perfect score, which is where I want to know if you do better than us. See if someone did get through without having to use a hint. And there you go. There's also a question of investment. Is getting a perfect score worth the time and stress of not taking that second clue once in a while and fighting through and, and 
think you know mm -hmm. only your group can answer that for your playthrough yeah that's something that comes up in all of these games with clues and hints and it's like i, I get it there's this like I, i'm gonna do it without clues but once that starts impacting your fun once you know one of your kids starts wandering away saying i'm bored and lays down on the floor with the dog which is kind of what happened <laughs> do you realize okay maybe we should get the clue and keep things moving now, before I get to my final thoughts, I do want to mention playtime. Uh, I have no idea who put the Board Game Geek entry in here. Uh, it says like 60 minutes. I'm, I'm thinking they might mean per chapter because this is a much more involved, longer escape room experience than the previous two games. Now, honestly, this is something I appreciate. Like and this gives us more game and more playtime and, and like more bang for your buck. Yes, I know we got a review copy, but still, I could tell I'd, I'd be happier. The, the money spent, I, you're getting more game than you did in the previous games. And like I said, we took advantage of this three-act structure to actually spread our game over three different sessions. And I am really glad we did. And I recommend doing the same just to make, like, then you get three fun game nights out of it instead of one. One caveat, though, the second act is oddly much shorter than the other two. And the last act is significantly longer than the first two. So take that into account when planning your game nights. If you do consider making it a two night thing, what I would suggest is do act one and two, excuse me. What I would suggest doing act one and two, one night, and then saving the third act for another day. And personally, I cannot see wanting to do this entire game in one setting. That would just be, it'd be too long. The save function here works great. So take advantage of it, use it. Yeah, it's very good to know. It would be easy to expect three similar lengths and get yourself into some scheduling trouble in that at that. So overall, The Goonies Escape with One-Eyed Willie's Rich Stuff, a coded Chronicles game, was a great experience. Well, I admit it, it wasn't the laugh out loud fun whimsy that Scooby-Doo Coded Chronicles had. We found this to be more engaging and rewarding. I think this was more fun for the adults than it was for the kids. Not that my kids didn't enjoy it, but they would have much rather had the Scooby-Doo experience, which honestly I think makes sense because this game is targeted at the nostalgia crowd. This is designed for older audiences who have a fondness for the Goonies. Not a lot of young kids are seeing it for the first time unless they're watching it with their parents. Now, if you're a diehard Goonies fan, you owe it to yourself to pick this one up, play through it. The, the, I honestly can't think of any reason you wouldn't enjoy it. If you're listening to this podcast, you obviously have some experience with hobby board gaming. You're probably going to dig this. This is going to let you experience one of your favorite movies in ways you never could have before. Now, if you're a fan of the Coded Chronicles system and you played through Scooby-Doo and you played through The Shining, um, or you played through them and you liked them, but there were issues... You won't have find that here. This is the best designed Coded Chronicles game to date. And again, I mentioned this gives me hope for the future of this game line. I'm looking forward to more Coded Chronicles games like the Goonies. Now, if you did cooperative puzzle, escape room in a box style games, you're going to find a lot to like in this box, whether you know the movie or not. Though I do admit it's going to be more fun if you're a Goonies fan. Finally, if you don't like puzzles and you don't like the Goonies, thanks for sticking around to the end of this review. I appreciate it. Uh, while I still think there's a chance you might enjoy this, go play a copy with a friend. It's probably not going to be a game for you to pick up for you or your group. Well, that's it for our review of The Goonies Escape with One-Eyed Willie's Rich Stuff, a Coded Chronicles game. As Mo said earlier, if you end up playing this game, we'd love to hear your thoughts and how your final score compares to his family's. Tell us all about it in the comments down below. I also invite you to check out the written review over at tabletopbellhop.com, which I think the big thing you may want to see is I'm going to have some pictures of our gameplay nights and I'm going to cover them up. So you're going to have to click to see through. So if you don't want to be spoiled, but that way you can get to see some of the components. And honestly, trust me, I'm not going to solve any puzzles for you, but you get to see some of those cool components and us having fun playing. And now the Bellhop Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. All right, so not a lot of games for us this past week. Um, Tori and Kat were over. We also did have a game night over at Brenda, so we do have a little bit to talk about. Um, first up, though, because I don't know if everyone remembers last week, we were complaining about the fact that by the time we got through the other games I wanted to play, everyone was too burnt out to play Charter Stones. So we didn't get to play last week, which was disappointing. So we played 
a game of Charter Stone, and we started with it. So we're like, hey, this way we get Charter Stone in. We're going to play Charter Stone first. Smart way to do it. This was our first game since Sean was down. So Sean hasn't missed anything here. Um, one of the things we did before we started that I do want to talk about a bit here is we talked about making Sean an automata. The, the, the charter he played, having it run through the automata rules. And we decided not to. Um, I read through them. They looked interesting. Um, it's one of those games where you're going to flip a card to see what you do. And it's got a fairly solid sounding AI. It would have made it so that his charter did stuff, which would interfere with what we're doing, and it would take up spots on the board. It sounded cool. But you know what? It just sounded fiddly. Like, like I think we'd rather focus on our own play and what we're doing and what our goals have been and what buildings we'll want to play instead of have to even worry about having one or two automata. Now, I will say, and I mentioned multiple times, that it already I'm tempted to play this game through a second time with the recharge kit. I think if I played again, I would be really tempted to start the game from the beginning with six full charters, whether that's get six players to play or have automata there for whoever's missing. Um, you can do, I think it's up to two automata. You might even build more. I think it's two. You can do up to two automata players. Um, though I know you can play solo, so maybe you can play with five automata. I don't know. Um, but yeah, we did decide not to do it. Um, what I have also considered is you can get it on Steam. And I have seen reviews of people playing it on Steam. There are a whole, there's a group of well-known podcasters that that's one of the things they did during COVID. They're like, we can't get together. So we're going to do a full Charterstone campaign on Steam and we're going to stream it, which I didn't watch because I didn't want to spoil it. And I'll admit that might be where we go. Instead of getting the recharge pack and flipping the board and starting over and putting rebuilding the index and all that, I might just do it on Steam. I'm definitely tempted to do that. But you know what? I don't want to start that when we haven't finished our full game first. So if that happens, that's going to be a while. We still have four full games to play in the physical version. Um, as for what happened in game eight, again, no spoilers. We're not going to spoil anything here. Uh, what's been interesting is it's neat to see that people are catching up. So I'll admit I took an early lead. I won a, quite a few of the early games. Um, Deanna, who we were worried her game wasn't even going to work because she wasn't building stuff. That's definitely not as much a problem anymore. Um, interestingly, the last two games were both won by the same person who up until that point hadn't won a game. And so far is dominating. Um, Cat and her cats and pumpkins has, has, has really like on the score track. She's like thirty ahead of us the last couple of games. She's got this engine going that we're gonna have to try to stop. Um, people are definitely catching up, and I think this is a good thing. Um, as for the king, um, we are really good at making the king angry. We may be at a point where you can't actually can't possibly make him happy by the end of the campaign. So that'll be interesting. Um, again, I mentioned, I don't know if the king is a good guy, so I don't know if I mind this. Uh, one thing, though, that, that caught me, and I don't know how, um, how the other players think, feel, but we completely, like, I, we got to the end, right? So, and this is only slight spoiler because it comes in game two you eventually get these goal cards that come into play and they have goals. And if you complete the goal, the player who completes the goal gets a little bonus. You get one renown, which isn't huge, but you get one thing. And then they get to make a decision and do something sometimes. So we remembered what the thing was to get the point, but forgot it was part of a larger mandate from the king to the point that once we got to the card, it was like, wait, we pissed it. Oh, shoot. We were supposed to. So it wasn't just do the thing. We, oh my God. I like they completely forgot. Now, I don't know if everyone else playing uh, there. Deanna's saying we did not all forget. <laughs> yeah, we did not all forget. I'm, I'm like, I don't even know, but I was shocked. I was like, oh, and I didn't want to fail at that this time. So that kind of sucks. So so don't don't forget the card that's in the bottom corner of the, the board while you're playing. Or do, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, so, yeah, it's interesting how the uh the shift has has happened where uh certain people have uh have kind of caught up and, and made up for any earlier losses what's interesting too is it's not like the game has changed significantly like it's not like a new thing was introduced and now in the mid game this is more important than that was so that's been kind of interesting right like that's a seafall thing i don't know if it, for people who played seafall seafall has three distinct sections of play and each section rewards certain styles of play. So if someone gets really ahead in the beginning, it, this happens to a lot of groups. Okay, so the, the first section of Seafall, someone will get so far ahead that people quit playing because they think they can't. 
And you should fight through that because then you get to the next section and it's going to reward a whole different style of play. And it's actually going to penalize that person who's ahead. And then you get to a third section at the end that again, switches things around. And, and unfortunately the group we played with got to that first part where one person kept winning and was like, screw it. I don't even want to play this game. That doesn't seem to happen here though. It's happening organically. Like there doesn't seem to have been a, well, now that we're scoring this instead of this, I don't, I don't even know what you do. So that's been interesting. Next one is founders of Teotihuacan. I think we've talked about this a bit on the show. What I liked about this last play, this was a four player game. All experienced players, everyone had played the game before, and it was nice to be able to just set the game up and not teach it. And this is definitely a game that rewards multiple plays. Like, like there, there is a level of mastery. Your first game, you're going to fumble. You're, you're going to build stuff without knowing why you're building it. You're not going to know what God tiles to expect. You're probably going to produce way more resources than you can ever spend. There's a whole, you're, you're not going to score the mass tiles quick enough and so on. Once you play game two, all it takes is that first game to really kind of grok everything. Um, one of the big things I've noticed, it's kind of odd. So one of the things I love about this game is the, the, the auction bidding action selection thing with the discs. What I've noticed in our most recent plays is no one's really taking advantage of it in the fact that no one plays more than one disc now. Because instead of having that powerful action, they'd rather take more actions. And I don't know if this is like one of those rule progressions where we're eventually then realize why we should be doing it again or if it's just like a full thing like don't do that i have to assume there's got to be good reasons for it or like during play testing they would just say place a disc and get whatever level like there's definitely the thing where you don't play on the spot you wait till someone else does to be better but we're not seeing a lot of that i'm going to drop three chips because i'm going to get the thing so no one else can have it and make that rewarding so that's been interesting um we've all been trying new things they're definitely seem to be multiple paths you can take multiple ways to win um especially like switching between building the temple focusing on the god tiles for scoring or trying to get all the mass quicker than anyone else so that's kind of neat to see though the temples so far if you let a player get all the temples of one color and then paint their pyramid in that color it's ridiculous scoring like like to the fact that you'll during the game someone will have 10 points everyone else has 83 well if that person that had 10 did the temples right they'll still win and I, it seems odd almost broken i think what you need to do is if you see that happening the other three players or less need to team up to stop it from happening which i don't always enjoy in a game where, where it's like instead of doing what i want to do i need to do something else to stop someone else and now i feel like i'm being forced so that is the the one issue i've seen in the game so far uh, we seem to there seems to be one winning strategy that if not disrupted may be a little too powerful. If I was play testing, I'd totally be reporting this to someone because that's what it feels like. Right. Um, as for the game overall, we we still need a couple more games I think before a full review. I, I could review it now, but I want to for one see if we can disrupt the temple thing, if it's even possible. Um, one thing I do want to mention: you can buy it now. It is out. So we're actually slightly late on our review. Not that they, they didn't give me a date to have it out by, but I'm sure they probably wanted it by the time the game released. So we may bump this one up for next week. Um, overall, because you can't help but compare this to Teotihuacan, um, I prefer the full game. Deanna really prefers the full game. I will admit I like this for a quicker one-hour Euro feel. I, there's something about the resource management I really like, and I really like the action system. Though, again, less so now that I'm seeing that everyone just plays one disc. I'm like, I need to play with an experienced player who drops down a three for a good reason and go, oh, well, that's why you want to do it. Um, D is definitely not enjoying it as much as I am. She's, she's very much in the take it or leave it. Like, she's like, it's okay. But I'd rather play the real game, which is more of a challenge. Like, but Deanna likes longer, heavier games. I dig it as, a, as for what it is. So uh, as someone who's played to, to walk in, what sort of advantage does that give me over someone who's never played it before playing this or nothing at all? Nothing. I, I can't think of any overlap. The theme is the same. Right. Like uh, get your collecting mass, but like how you get them is completely different. The way you paint the temple is completely different. The temple in the other game doesn't score you anything based on other stuff happening on the board. It, it is is definitely a very different game. Right. Now, someone who's played founder founders of Gloomhaven might have an advantage. Despite the fact that everyone swearing up and down, the two are not related. Uh, I think if you are, are, are familiar with the, 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 
build the build the resource building to give you the resources to build the point building you might have a bit of an advantage but nothing entail like like you you're not rolling dice it's not a rondelle honestly the only thing that's the same is the theme like to the fact that it might be a detriment i don't know might be a detriment to even call this tale people walking mm. like i i don't know if they might have been better off to come up with another t name because to me, it's it doesn't feel like Tale to Walk in Light. Oh wow! Okay. All right. So the other thing I did want to mention is I have finished reading the One Ring role playing game starter set. Um, some really quick thoughts. I've talked about this quite a bit. The system's interesting. Um, roll a bunch of d6 dice pools combined with a d12. Um, but it's not a d12, which I totally missed. I I was looking through the box set kind of in prep to giving a review of it. And I was looking at what's in there and oddly there's some stuff in the box set. This is an interesting choice that is there for the full game that aren't actually used in the starter set, but they're like cool to have tools for when you play the full game. And I'm like, that's a, a interesting. I like aliens. I think did that too. I had some stuff that, that you don't need for the base game, but you know what, when you go play a full game, it's nice to have some additional cards and stuff, stuff that you can't include in a hardcover rule book. Right. Right. It, it's it's cards and tiles and stuff. There's this uh, whole stance system that's not in this. And there's a whole traveling system, which unfortunately I really wanted to check out the traveling system in the one ring. It's not in this starter set. There's a simplified version. But anyway, I'm looking through this stuff. So besides seeing this stuff that's never called for in the book, because I'm like, what is this stuff? This wasn't in my book. And I, I finally found a sidebar in the rule book book that explained what they were. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's actually kind of neat. I noticed the D12 is not a D12. It's a 12-sided die. That's a D10 with two special symbols on top. So I had said that the one I have Sauron replaced the one and the Gandalf's rune replaced the 12. That's not true. There is an I have Sauron and there's a Gandalf's rune and then the numbers one to 10, which actually changes the distribution in a, in a significant way. Mm -hmm. And honestly makes it a less of a less variable because now you're only looking at ones to tens. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, Oh yeah, that's cool. That's actually better than I thought. I, I, I totally missed that. Um, I finished the Shire book, which I've kind of talked about before. It's reading Lord of the Rings. If you're a Lord of the Rings fan, you're going to enjoy reading that book. If you're not a Lord of the Rings fan, it might be, you know, well, I have to assume the DM who's going to run this is probably a Lord <laughs> of the Rings fan. Again, reviewing, I, I finished the Shire book. Shire book was, was, was entertaining. I don't know how much I retained. Tom gave me a short quiz the other day. And so far I've retained none <laughs> of it, it seems like, but it's there to reference, right? Um, I'm basically ready. We're ready for the read review. I just don't know when that's going to fit because we got to review founders. We got a couple other things to review. I don't know where it's going to fit in. I am slightly tempted to possibly do an RPG starter set episode where we'll review both the Warhammer one and this, although the Warhammer one's not obligation. So I don't know. Anyway, ready to read review it. I may actually run this. I'm, I'm still debating possibly enlisting Tori cat and my kids to play this. <laughs> The problem is figuring out when, like, we'd only be able to play, say, a couple hours a night before the kids go to bed, and then we can move on to something else. That may happen. All right. Well, what is, what about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? Oh, yeah. As I said, a couple more plays of Founders of TOT Huacan. Um, I'm pretty sure there's solo rules. I think I remember solo rules. Assuming they're solo rules, I need to play them. Um, speaking of solo rules, I still have to try Gramento solo. Uh, a Garento review may come eventually. I basically want to have it ready so I can, you know, if fill in a gap, I can throw in out a quick review. Um, it's a great game. Just go buy Garento. And you don't need me to write a review. Just go buy it. It's awesome. If you like abstract strategy games, buy it. But I would like to do up a formal review of the production version at some point. Um, but again, obligation games come before that. Um, I do want to finish the Warhammer starter set. Again, I may be able to, uh, I'm, I'm considering a two episode Maybe even like do a topic like what do we look for in an RPG starter set? And or maybe some of the best starter sets out there. I don't know. Something like that. Again, I'm answering my own question there where I prefer to answer your questions. So may or may not get to that. Um, unfortunately, yesterday, today, Tori and Kat canceled for Friday. Um, we basically told them, like, it's good Friday. They do so much stuff with their family. I was shocked. They're like, no, no, we're good. I'm like, you're gonna be free on good Friday. They're like, yeah, no, sure enough. Um <laughs> one of their parental units uh, had stuff planned without telling them. And um, so they will not be coming over. So I don't know what else is going to happen. 
uh, this weekend. Maybe D and I will get some plays in or something, or I'll play Founder solo or Dorinto solo. I'll finish reading the Warhammer starter set. Who knows? Um, one other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to send this off to another reviewer. So the Draconis Invasion expansion, we'll be able to get another Canadian reviewer's perspective on. This should be going out tomorrow. Uh, I do have some shipping to do tomorrow. I guess that's about it. I don't know. The, uh, playing more stuff on Board Game Arena. Space Base, awesome on Board Game Arena. Yep. Res Arcana, unfathomable on Board Game Arena. I don't that, that is so a game I need to play in person. I, apparently, People love this game, and I'm like, I keep having cards that let me play dragons and I, I say, okay, I'll play a dragon. Then it says on which card and there's no cards I can play it on. I have no idea what I can do with my dragons that I keep being able to play. Cause if I hit don't, like, don't play that on a card, it goes away and I've wasted it. Wow. I don't know. I don't have any dragons in my deck. I keep trying to play dragons and I failed every time. So I keep, I'm right. I'll just not do that and do something else instead. I guess. I don't know. So yeah, I I don't know. I don't. My deck has no dragons. I need I to watch my play through. I need. To, I I don't know. Yeah, I just I, like even the components being pushed around. Like I think if I physically had them, like Maybe. I yeah. this just seems like a game I need to play in person. Like people love this game. I just feel like like obviously I'm missing something. Yep. And I'm doing better this game than our first game, but I am completely lost. I I, I was saying D had to tell me how I got the five points I got to get second in the say in the yeah. first game. I had no idea. See, I figured out how to get points, but I've yet to be able to build an engine to get them. That's yeah. the problem I'm having. I'm like, I can't, like, you have these set decks that you should be able to, like, build engines with, right? Isn't that kind of the point of the game? And D's saying she played a dragon in the first game, and it didn't go on another card. So I kept I, getting attacked by a dragon in the first game. That yeah, must have been D's. I guess. I, I just know. kept having the react to dragon attack. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. All yeah, right. see? <laughs> I don't even remember what else we're playing on there. Oh. Tapestry's still awesome on there. Yeah, uh, Arnak didn't actually restart. I don't know. You tried to restart it? But no, because I don't think Jeff ever joined. I hit ah, rematch, okay. so I kept everyone in. Ah, okay. So we need to start another one that's three-player only. Yeah, my duel with the other side of the board's definitely been interesting. It's been oh, a long time since I played that way. I'm so upset because I, 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 I saw I was about to make a mistake. I hit cancel. I stopped. I looked. And then made the mistake. And I made the mistake anyway. And I went <laughs> in the next turn, like it came to be my turn again. I looked and I went, I... I but now I can't. That's funny. I can't place that there, and that's exactly what I had been that, planning that on funny. avoiding. But yeah, that was that was frustrating. Um, oh, and also, I don't. We we're not explicit in this section. Um, man, tapestry sometimes with the undo. <laughs> like Deanna had one this game, yeah. where like, why can't I undo this obviously stupid thing? So you had one of your brown houses on a tile. Yeah, I put and out. the attack that tile thinking. That brown house was the brown house. Jesus Christ. Thinking that brown house was the brown house icon on the tile being the reward for taking oh, that tile. Oh, okay. So she used helicopters to be able to attack you across the map to be able to do this. And she could have went anywhere on the map. Here I had an empty one with a brown oh, house on it up by me. Ouch. And once she did it, it did the, sorry, you can't do the thing. And you hit undo, it didn't work. Oh. Even though no new information came out, nothing was revealed, she couldn't back out. I was wondering like, why she attacked me. I'm like, because I got the... She, she was trying to get her trap, last brown house like, up for the 10 points, like, you right? you play a trap. No, I can't. I don't have any trap cards. You know I don't have any trap cards. Oh, that too. I, that, <laughs> that's another dumb thing. And why the hell does safe space keep resetting? To, and there's no reason not to choose choose best. Oh, yeah. The, I don't know if you've done that. Always. If you no, tried no. both of them. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I checked them because both. Because it's presenting you with options that I still think there's an obvious best, but it's giving me the option. Yeah, no, I. When I, it's very, like, like it, the best works as well as the only. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. I use that all the time. And I mean, I won last game, so obviously it works. Yeah. <laughs> but just, just the fact that, um, like, you guys were all waiting for me to accept my one coin. Because I forgot to turn it on at the beginning of the game. Like, come on, default that on. Yeah. So, yeah, no, it's and the other one. I'm The thing about Tapestry is I, I seem to do all right at the beginning. But then you got all of a sudden I like seem to stall. But at about, you know, 60 or 70 points while you guys are up at 130 all of a sudden. Well, I definitely so, rank up as it goes on because I get more resources so I can do more things that get more points. So I, I, I just I feel like I, there's something I'm missing and I'm not, yeah, I'm not doing. Sure. And I don't know, but. That's a, if you were playing in person, you'd see it. Yeah, but like, I, I don't even notice what you're doing 90% of the time. It's not a game where I read back through the log 
Yeah. I just kind of look at where the board state is and go, okay, you're going to get that building before me or not. Right. Yeah, like, yeah. I don't oh, absolutely. really, yeah, yeah. I don't really watch what you're doing to get points. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I guess that's true. D D is saying the problem with the traps being, being automatic is you can't bluff. Cause it goes, Sean gets a chance to play a trap card. And then if it just said Sean, if it didn't say Sean has a chance to play a trap card, you would know. Yeah. Cause technically you could have a trap and you could hold it because you think you're going to get attacked by an, I, I, D makes a good point. Yeah, that's no, true. that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. Hadn't thought of it. All right. I think it's time to move on now. Yeah. Yeah. We're good. And now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Evan Reno. Thanks tech. Timothy Smith. Thanks, Timothy. Cat and Tori. Enjoy your Easter with your family. We'll just be here playing games by ourselves. William Fisher. Thank you. Danielle Thomas. Thank you. Our major Kayla. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to slam that portcullis. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all across the web as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. Actually, that newsletter is at tabletopbellhop.com. I do not think will work right now. We have switched over. I don't know if anyone's noticed this. Slight, slight announcement. We have switched to a different provider for sending newsletters. Um, so if you notice, it looks a little different. That's why. Um, it does still work technically. Okay. The problem is you're signing up for the wrong newsletter, and we manually check every week to make sure no one signed up there to port them over manually, but that's fine. We do have to update it, so we should probably cut that out until we at least get that fixed. Um, we are using a new provider, for which, which is better for lots of other reasons. Now, no, if you like the content we're providing, we do some cool stuff for our supporters. We send out copies of our pre-production show notes, which this week are substantial compared to last week. Sorry, you didn't get much last week. Um, we give you access to a private Discord where you can hang out with other Tabletop Bellhop fans, as well as Sean and I, where we share all kinds of stuff, geeky gaming and non-gaming sometimes. You can also get a copy of our bonus audio where you will get, if you weren't here live, you get to hear the coffee chat and our after show, as well as the audio from our brunches, which I have no idea how well that sounds because we spend a lot of time looking at Kickstarters. But hey, it's there if you want it. And sometimes some other cool stuff. Uh, that's at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop. And I got to say, with the amount of work we've been doing with other stuff, it would be awesome if we could get some new supporters um, so that when we get asked questions like, what game are you going to buy next? Maybe I'll have an answer and we can do those improvements and maybe start streaming Gloomhaven again if we can get some new tech down in the basement. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight with lobbyists. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to stick around and join us in the after show and stop by Sundays on YouTube for brunch. For the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And, and game, game on. on.